Hamidik Tusnulish and Miller Umshkem Ikiokta and Verdus Marshoka Agus Ninon Fehefe, though on Darakim. We're beginning with the Mother and Baby Institutions Payment Scheme Bill 2022, second stage. And Minister, if you could move the second reading motion that the bill be now read a second time. Move that the bill now be read a second time. Yeah. Last count, Corla. Today I'm bringing the Mother and Baby Institution Payment Scheme Bill before this House. The primary purpose of this bill is to establish a scheme to make payments and to provide for a form of enhanced medical card to eligible applicants. The scheme will recognise the time spent in the harsh conditions, emotional abuse and other forms of mistreatment, stigma and trauma experienced by people while residing in mother and baby or county home institutions. I want to reiterate that the government is under no illusion that there is any financial payment or service provision which could make up for the immense pain and suffering endured by so many of our citizens whose lives have been impacted by the shameful legacy of mother and baby home institutions in Ireland. That immense pain has had a unique impact on each and every survivor. We cannot take that pain away and I'm truly sorry for that. What we can do is offer support to all those who need it and ensure that such things never happen again. I want to thank survivors for sharing their experiences with me and with many of you here today to help all of us understand what they've been through. Recognising the unique impact of time spent in these institutions on each and every survivor requires a wide range of tailored remedies. Redress means different things to different people and as such the government's action plan for survivors and former residents of mother and baby in county home institutions seeks to provide an enduring response to the priority needs of all those concerned. The mother and baby institution payment scheme is one action in this broad reaching plan which spans a wide range of priority issues that have been raised by survivors and includes significant commitments across the areas of apology, access to personal information, health supports, financial payments, memorialisation, records, archives and databases, education and research and dignified burial. The ongoing work in this area is a top priority for me, with eight of the 22 commitments set out in the action plan already achieved and intensive work underway on many others. Following the publication of the general scheme of this bill last March, the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Children conducted pre-legislative scrutiny. I'm grateful to the Chair, Deputy Function and to all members for their examination of the legislative proposals. I also appreciate the Committee acknowledging the features of the scheme which they welcome, including the low burden of proof built into the design of the scheme and the moves beyond the Commission of Investigation's recommendations, particularly in relation to including survivors who were resident in the institutions post-1973 within this scheme. This low burden of proof has been achieved by basing the approach to the scheme on time spent in an institution. I carefully considered the committee's recommendations. I believe that this bill represents a considerable improvement on the general scheme which was published last March. I have been able to incorporate some of the committee's recommendations in the bill. Other of the recommendations are being considered as part of the design and the operational rollout of the scheme itself while the intent of some others are being achieved through the broader action plan. Firstly, as recommended by the committee, the scheme has been designed with regard to human rights and equality principles. The proposals were informed by an advisory paper prepared by the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, as well as by the public consultation process undertaken by Oak. In terms of the administration of the scheme, the recommendations that this should be underscored by independence also feature in the bill. The Office of the Chief Deciding Officer will function as part of my department in order to benefit from the department's corporate structures and allow for quicker establishment of the scheme. However, the bill provides that the Chief Deciding Officer will be independent in the performance of his or her function. Furthermore, recourse to an independent appeals process is also provided for in the bill. With regard to the recommendation, recommended expansion of the scheme to cover additional institutions, the bill provides for the list of institutions in Schedule 1 to be expanded if it were to come to light that an institution fulfilled a similar function with regard to single women and their children as the 14 mother and baby institutions for which the state had a regulatory or inspection function. 
One of the pre-legislative scrutiny recommendations called for, by survivor, called for survivors to be provided with funded legal aid at all stages of engaging with the scheme. The bill provides for applicants to be financially supported in obtaining legal, circum, legal services in two circumstances, where an affidavit is required and where they wish to seek legal advice at the point of accepting a payment under the scheme and thus signing a legal waiver. It's important to note that the scheme will adopt a non-adversarial approach and applicants will not be required to bring forward evidence of abuse suffered. Applicants will be supported in making an application to the scheme and throughout that process. In terms of the recommendation to increase the payment amounts under the scheme, I've improved the overall approach to the payment rates by introducing more refined bands. This will benefit applicants, particularly where they would have been at the upper end of a given annual band under the original proposals. I've also introduced into the bill that periods of temporary absence of up to 180 days can be included when calculating the total duration of a person's time in the relevant institution and their corresponding financial payment. This recognises that many mothers and children spend time outside the institution, for example, as a result of a hospital stay. The inclusion of such periods of temporary absence will also have the effect of increasing the payment amounts which some applicants may be entitled to. There was another cohort of recommendations which are not directly reflected in the bill, but which are being incorporated in the design and op operational rollout of the scheme. When the scheme is operational, a comprehensive communications campaign will be undertaken, both in Ireland and abroad. My officials are currently working on the overall commu com communication strategy for the scheme. The recommendation that a stakeholder advisory group should be established has also been taken on board as part of the design and rollout, with plans in development to put in place a stakeholder reference group. Under Action 1 of the Government's Action Plan, work is also underway on the development of a new structure to support wider stakeholder engagement. This brings me to a number of recommendations where the intent is being achieved through the broader action plan. For example, in terms of the use of sensitive and appropriate language, researchers from NUI Galway, funded by my department, have been working on the project aiming to highlight the stigmatising and labelling language that has been used in the past and to provide guidance as to how to address this issue. With regard to the role of local authorities in relation to assisting survivors, I continue to li liaise with the Minister for Housing on how survivors can be better supported. Counselling support is available to all survivors and former residents of mother and baby in county home institutions through the National Counselling Service in the HSE. It's free of charge, including out of our support, and those who, who identify themselves as survivors of the institutions are prioritised for the next available counselling space. Finally, and within the context of the action plan, I want to address the sentiments expressed by those who feel excluded from redress because their circumstances are not covered by the payment scheme. I want to stress again that it is through the action plan that the government is delivering the most inclusive response possible to the suffering experienced by so many who have been hurt by Ireland's legacy in this area. The scheme is one element of that plan and can only deliver a limited amount. Following deliberations on the design of the scheme, it was decided that a general payment based on time spent in the institution was the best option in order to provide a non-adversarial approach to delivering the scheme. This is not a perfect solution, but it means that applicants will not have to bring forward of evidence of abuse, harm or mistreatment in order to benefit from the scheme. This approach, unfortunately, does not cater to the circumstances of people who were boarded out, which, given the very individual experiences, would have, would have to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. The action plan includes other measures which will provide support and assistance to those who were boarded out as children, including access to birth and early life information as part of the Birth Information and Tracing Act, and the provision of an ex gratia payment to reimburse anyone who was boarded out and had to pay inheritance taxes for farms which they inherited from their foster parents. Furthermore, funding of €330,000 has been provided for specialist therapeutic counselling services to persons who were boarded out or placed as nur at nurse as children. Those who were boarded out following having spent more than six months in a mother and baby or county institution will, of course, be able to apply to the payment scheme for the time spent in that institution. In relation to children who spent less than six months in an institution and who were adopted or otherwise separated from their birth family, the overwhelming priority need expressed is access to records. 
the action plan provides for their needs through the recently enacted Birth Information and Tracing Act. From the 3rd of October, statutory information and tracing service under the Act opened, guaranteeing people access to their birth and early life information. In the first two weeks, over 4,000 applications have been received under the Act. The government's proposal for the scheme means that financial payments will be made to an estimated 34,000 people and a form of enhanced medical card will be provided to an estimated 19,000 people who are resident in mother and baby and county home institutions at a value of approximately 800 million euro. These proposals go significantly beyond the recommendations of the Commission of Investigation, which would have seen an estimated 6,500 people eligible for a financial payment at an estimated cost of 400 million euro. This will be the largest scheme of its kind in the history of the state in terms of beneficiaries, recognising the scale of the impact of mother and baby institutions on Irish society. I will now outline the key parts of the bill as initiated. Part one of the bill provides for a number of preliminary matters, including commencement, the payment of expenses for the administration of the Act, and making of regulations and orders. Part one also provides for definitions relevant to the bill. A key definition is that of a relevant person, encompassing a person who is resident as a child or a mother, or both, in one of the institutions listed in Schedule 1, and therefore eligible to apply for the scheme. Part two provides for the establishment of the scheme and its duration, guaranteeing that all applications received before the closing date of the scheme will be processed. The scheme will be administered through the Office of the Chief Deciding Officer of the Mother and Baby Institution Payment Scheme, which will be situated in my department. The Chief Deciding Officer will be independent in the performance of their function, functions relating to the scheme. In order that the scheme may open as quickly as possible, this approach allows for the Office to draw on my department's existing infrastructure and resources to support the fastest possible establishment of the scheme, including the administrative structures required to operate it. The Chief Deciding Officer will be provided with staff to assist with the operation of the scheme and there is potential to contract third party support to undertake some of the more straightforward processing tasks. The Office of the Chief Deciding Officer will widely promote awareness of the scheme in Ireland and abroad and will prepare an annual report which I will lay before each house of the Oireachtas. Part 3 of the Bill provides for all aspects of the application, determination and notification processes for the applicants and also for the arrangements in respect of internal reviews and the independent appeals process where an applicant is not happy with a determination on their application. The benefits available to applicants under the scheme are a general payment, a work-related payment, an enhanced medical card and a health support payment. The overall determination of an applicant's eligibility for benefits under the scheme hinges on his or her period of residence in one of the institutions. The general and work-related payment amounts will, raise, will rise based on time spent in one of the institutions. In terms of eligibility for the health support payment, applicants who are deemed eligible for a form of enhanced medical card under the scheme but who live outside of Ireland may choose to take the card or they may opt instead to receive a once-off health support payment of €3,000 in recognition of their individual health needs. The bill sets out what people need to do to make an application to the scheme. One application can co cover time spent in different institutions, so only one application to the scheme is required. However, if an additional institution is added to Schedule 1, a person will be entitled to make a further application in respect of that institution. Certain applications can be prioritised, having regard to the age or status of health of the applicant, if the Chief Deciding Officer considers it is in the interest of fairness and efficiency to do so. To support the assessment of applications, the Bill provides for the Office of the Chief Deciding Officer to be able to search the copy of the Commission of Investigation archive held by my department to establish the applicant's period of residence in a relevant institution. The Office of the Chief Deciding Officer will also have the authority to request relevant information from an information source where they hold relevant records that are not held in the archive. In the limited circumstances where records may not be available, the Bill allows for affidavits to be sought at application stage. Where relevant, a formal offer of payment will issue to an applicant and he or she will have six months to accept or reject the offer. Applicants will also have the right to request a review of the determination and an independent appeal. The period of six months will give applicants enough time to avail of independent legal advice in relation to the legal waiver. The waiver would only be signed at the point where the applicant accepts an offer of payment under the scheme, so the applicant will have full knowledge of what they are being offered prior to signing. It is the intention to make a capped amount of financial support available to applicants for the purposes of obtaining independent legal advice. 
A contribution to legal costs will also be provided in cases where an applicant makes an affidavit to apply to the scheme. Applicants who are resident in a relevant institution for a minimum of six months will be eligible for a form of enhanced medical card. The card will then enable the holder to access the services specified in the bill free of charge. Applicants who are deemed eligible for a medical card but live outside of the state may opt to receive a once-off payment of €3,000 instead of the card. The bill provides that a person can apply on behalf of a relevant person in specified circumstances. An application may also be made for a general payment and or a work-related payment on behalf of a person who would, who would have been eligible to apply but has passed away since the date of the state apology on the 13th of January 2021. Part four of the bill contains provisions on a range of ancillary matters. These include the power to make regulations, to prescribe a person as an information source where they hold relevant records, the power of those administering the scheme to process personal data and special categories of personal data for the purposes of fulfilling functions set out in the bill, a prohibition on the disclosure of confidential information by those administering the scheme, the service of documents and penalties. In addition, it provides that general payments and work-related payments may under the scheme made under the scheme are exempt from income tax, capital gains tax and capital acquisitions tax. Furthermore, the part provides for the carrying out of, of a review of the operation of the scheme after two years and again at the end of the scheme. It also provides that an additional institution may be added to the schedule of eligible institutions by way of a ministerial order. I'd like to conclude by reiterating my appreciation to survivors and their families for their ongoing patience as government continues to work through these complex issues. Recognising the importance of delivering this scheme for survivors, I hope to be able to bring the bill swiftly through both houses of the Oireachtas. In parallel with the legislation, the significant work required to establish the scheme is underway. I want to assure survivors that we are doing everything in our power to deliver this scheme as quickly as possible. Subject to the legislation being passed and enacted and the administrative structures being established, the scheme will open for applications as soon as is possible in 2023. I commend this bill to the House. Thank you, Minister. Now moving over to Sinn Féin. We have the Kathleen function. I think you're sharing, are you? Are you? Yeah, I'm taking 10 minutes. No. Um, and then five, probably five and five, I'd say. OK, um, thanks very much, last Karen Corla, and thanks, Minister. I, at the start, I want to say, and I think I've said this in here before, that... Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel uh, you were left with an awful lot of the, the legacy issues. Um, uh, the cynical part of me thinks possibly other ministers uh, didn't mind leaving the stacks of files on their desk for somebody else to deal with. And I do acknowledge that you've dealt with a lot of the outstanding issues in relation to the mother and baby institutions. Um, we haven't always agreed. In fact, we've disagreed on lots of parts of it. But I do acknowledge that, that you have tried to uh, push it on at least um, unlike uh, previous ministers who held the post before you so I the the comments I, I make I make in that I suppose uh, spirit uh, when I was thinking about today and exactly what I wanted to say because sometimes there's so much that you can kind of you don't even know where to start and then other times I think when we talk about this topic I feel like I've I, I say the same thing time and time again and for me, I suppose a lot of it goes back to there is a terrible patriar patriarchal mindset at the heart of all this. First of all, if we look at the history of the institutions and how or why they were even allowed to exist. But if we also just took, took a, take a look at some of the timeline in relation to the report, the, the Commission of Investigation report, first of all, we had the leak. Um, at the time, we actually called for a Garda investigation into it. There was an internal investigation launched, but as far as I'm aware, we have no... Uh, information on that or what exactly happened. Um, then we had the actual report itself and I, I will never forget sitting upstairs in the office waiting for the report to be you know, handed around to us or put into our pigeonholes. I will never forget reading that report because I just was dismayed from the very start. I tried to say, okay, look, I've only started this. You know, there's obviously a lot in it, and let's see how it goes. But honestly, the dismissive tone and the disingenuous language just was a disaster, and that's, uh, you know, saying, saying something. 
Um, I really do believe, and I think a lot of survivors felt this, that maybe not the authors of the report, but everybody else understood, you know, the torture, the deprivation and the humiliation that was hidden behind the walls of those institutions. When you think of 15%, which is the equivalent of 9,000 of all of the babies that were born into one of these institutions died, that just tells its own very, very sad and very horrific um, story. There was a call from some quarters to repudiate the report. Uh, we asked, as a children's committee, we invited the authors of the report to come in. Um, they, of course, declined. Um, there was then an investigation. Uh, RT did a, a programme in relation to illegal adoptions. I believe there is a report due from Dr Niall Muldoon in relation to that as well. And I just say all this just to see, like, we already know how much people who are sent to these institutions are born into the institutions were failed, and then they had all of this as well. Um, then Professor Daly, to add insult to injury, went and spoke at an event in Oxford. Again, we were at the, they were asked to come into the committee to give some explanation of their findings. No, that they wouldn't do that. They totally refused any of those invitations. Um, then we had the information and tracing bill, and while I acknowledge it's a step forward for a lot of people, there's still that mandatory information session, and that brings me back to this whole patriarchal mindset that it's sort of like people who were sent to the institutions or born there have to be constantly told, well, now we're not really sure if you're going to be able for all of this, and that is just inherent in all of this, this, uh, you know, we kind of know best attitude. Uh, we then had judicial cases which were successful. Um, and then, in contrast to that, we had the burials bill, which I actually think was a really good example of legislation being done the right way. Uh, stuff that was discussed in pre-ledge being taken on board, amendments, not all of them, but some of them at committee stage being taken on board. And that's in contrast, I believe, to this piece of legislation and also to the information and birth uh, legislation. So, what I, in, in relation particularly to this piece, I, I kind of give that, and I know nobody in here necessarily needs a history on the situation, but I just think it's important for us to realise how time and time again people have been failed um, by the state and failed by the religious organisations, failed by the system. And unfortunately, you know, we are going to be added into that failure if we, as this generation of politicians, don't take this properly on board and actually make the, their, you know, the proper recommendations and ensure that it isn't just words on a page and it isn't just nodding heads of sympathy and you know it's terrible what happened and we can all apologize but we actually have to see the proper action and by that I mean a lot of the stuff that was in the Oak consultation report which survivors were very very happy with that process so the specific things I want to mention are in relation to the the six month rule for me I just I will never understand that I, I cannot understand how you know, you could be seven or eight months in an institution and because you were maybe five months, all of a sudden you're totally left out. I, I just totally disagree with that and we'll be bringing forward amendments at committee stage. I don't like the inclusion of a legal waiver. Again, I think it goes back to that mindset of we sort of know best and there's an, an issue of trust. And I also want to take the opportunity to put on the record that I know of some legal firms who, over the, since the, the report was published, are writing to survivors, trying to make, kind of say to them that they, they potentially need legal assistance with some of the stuff. And I think that those legal firms should take a look, good long look at themselves because in some cases they're just trying to get people to sign up um, and get money from very, very vulnerable people. And those firms know exactly who they are. And I think that they should absolutely stop in, in that situation. The exclusion of the board of doubt is just horrific. And I know you made reference to it in your own um, speech as well, Minister. I particularly want to mention, and I know you're aware of them, the, the two brothers that Deputy Pa Daly regularly refers to, James Sugru and his brother that were uh, in the board of doubt. And it says, you say in your own speech about how they'll be able to apply if they were six months. Of course, that doesn't take into account the fact that in most cases they were used as slaves um, in, in this, this situation. And I also want to ask a question in relation to that. Is it still just a list of institutions that were in the mother and baby investigation or, or, or has it been expanded? Um, also, the UN human rights experts, you know, they, they spoke a lot about systemic racism faced by mixed race people who were resident in the institutions. And I think a lot of that doesn't seem to have been taken on board. 
58,208 mothers and children passed through one of the mother and baby institutions. And this is the total number of people who should be supported through any proposed redress scheme. And that brings me on to the pharmaceutical companies and the religious orders who have come out and who have publicly apologised. So therefore they have acknowledged their role in all of this. And yet they seem to think that they have absolutely no part to pay when it comes to writing a cheque. And I think it's absolutely disgusting, particularly when we think of the amount of wealth that religious organisations have and when we look at the pharmaceutical companies and the amount of wealth that they have too. And I think that they should be pursued strongly and I actually think that we should be looking to see is there any way of pursuing them through the courts because I think if somebody acknowledges and apologises for something publicly, surely they're saying publicly they have a very strong role to, to play and I think that that is just absolutely disgusting to think that those companies felt it was okay to use people as human guinea pigs and they can just walk away from their responsibilities now. I just want to again acknowledge absolutely everybody that has ever contacted me or every, anyone I have ever met. And a lot of the time, you know, we, we, we acknowledge and we say, and I know it's meant sincerely in relation to the bravery and the courage of people, but I always think as well, and I think particularly for, for women who were sent to these institutions, when they come in and they feel they need to tell you all their very personal medical stuff, just because they're trying to get access to medical services. That is just totally and utterly wrong. A lot of the time, they're very, very personal situations that you would potentially not even want to discuss with your own family. And then you're coming into a total stranger because you're so desperate to get uh, medical services being left on waiting lists. And I hope that whatever medical card is being proposed is going to be strong enough that they're not just going to join the back of the queue of a three or four or five or six year waiting list, that they actually will get the services, particularly for women who are left to give birth in the most horrific of circumstances and who physically have never been the same since. I think I feel strongly about that. And I feel strongly about all of it, to be honest, but I really, it really bothers me about the religious institutions and the pharmaceutical companies. And I hope they're watching today, not that they probably care. Um, but I really, really hope that we can go after them in some way, shape or form and that they are made to pay their fair share of everything. But there is no price that can be put. And we all know that. But the very, very first thing you do is you don't start by excluding people. Everybody needs to be included in this scheme and the Oak recommendations that survivors trusted. Um, they really, really trusted that process. And anyone I spoke to actually was, I don't know if happy is the right word, but they, they, they were very satisfied with that process. They felt they were listened to, they felt they were given time, and those are the recommendations that we should be looking at today for the redress. Thank you very much, Les Kian Kaula. Minister, I welcome the opportunity to discuss the Mother and Baby Institutions redress scheme. And to begin with, I would like to acknowledge all those who have contacted members throughout this house to outline their views and indeed their concerns and the provisions of this bill. And before I address several matters of concern that I have with this bill, I want to say that time is a crucial factor here. It has been said to me on numerous occasions that valuable time has been allowed to go by while those who fell victim of these institutions awaited justice. And that is not just in the decades gone by. It is also the case with the delays leading up to the report of the Commission of Investigation and the processes that have been mired in controversy since. The people who are seeking justice seeking redress, seeking answers to their questions for their entire lives have been let down by these delays. They do not have the luxury of being able to wait for answers or to be afforded justice. For decades, the women who were incarcerated in mother and baby homes were shut away from society. They were hidden, silenced and worked. Their children were in many cases subjected to a separation from their mothers that defies belief. They were often treated as commodities to be traded. These women and these children were treated like very few others in society, and yet the pursuit of truth of justice for their own histories have been beset by obstacles. Records missing or destroyed, deliberately or otherwise. Accounts misrepresented, as we have seen in recent times, or accounts not being given the context they deserved. And over the years they watched on as they were spoken about by those who did not share the horrors they endured, or spent their lives piecing back together the missing parts of those lives. I want us to recognise this <clears throat> because it is only by ensuring that the issues we are discussing are framed by that knowledge and the consequences of those experiences. Unfortunately, as much as I believe the Minister is committed to doing right by survivors of these institutions, I have to say that this bill falls short in a number of areas. 
Let me deal first of all with the deeply flawed decision to exclude from redress anybody who a child, while a child was in one of these institutions for less than 180 days. Minister, let's be clear. I've been told that our survivors are feeling sold out by this, and this is a term that was used, sold out. Now, that is not the response you want to hear when you are seeking to make some amends to a person for a lifetime of being wronged. Minister, imagine a person who was in a mother and baby home for six months or less. Do you think that their sense of loss, the gaps that may remain in their personal history, would be any less than those who are in those, one of those places for two years or more? A stay of three to six months was typical of Shan Ross Abbey, so that is where the feeling of being sold out comes from. Do you think that nobody who was in an institution covered by this bill or who was born in one and stayed there for less than six months before they were moved on or exported should be recognised for that? Are their potential needs any less? Is the emotional impact of what they had lost, who they had lost, or the overall consequences for them any less? I don't understand the sense in all of this, not even a medical card. I can only put it down to an effort to limit liability, to reduce costs. I am reluctant to say that, but it is the only answer I can come up with. When talking about the survivors of these institutions, we must talk about them all. All of them had an element of self-determination taken away from them by a system that dominated their direction in life, and that deeply affected their lives from that time on. This is a fundamental flaw, Minister. You must see this. The nuns of Shenross Abbey got the money for their transaction regardless, yet an arbitrary bear is set for survivors. Deep down, Minister, you know this is deeply, deeply wrong and I urge you to revise this or accept an amendment to address it. And Minister, this shortcoming also affects those who were boarded out as children and who in many cases were the work of others is unjust in the extreme. Furthermore, the legal waiver remains, so we see more restrictions placed upon those who actually qualify for the scheme. This effectively removes the ability of people to exercise their right to justice and to pursue legal action. Yet at the same time, the religious orders who sought to profit from their inhumane methods and treatments of women and children are afforded all the time they want to further delay justice for survivors. Where are they now? I'll tell you where they are, Minister. They are again holding back from the survivors. They are again abandoning them, wasting their valuable time and running down the clock. They are pinching every penny just like they kept women and children at substance levels throughout their time in these places. It's the same old story for survivors, different rules applying to them. They are left without, while those, including the pharmaceutical companies, have a free hand to act as they please. The UN Special Rapporteur, UN Human Rights Committee and the United Nations Human Rights Experts have all called for appropriate compensation, removal of legal waivers and for any scheme to address child victims of racial discrimination within Irish institutions. These calls have been largely ignored. I urge the Minister to address this and rethink some of the provisions in this bill and to take a hard line in those negotiations and get them wrapped up as soon as possible. Earlier I said I spoke of the obstacles that survivors of these institutions had to overcome. I spoke of accounts being misrepresented or accounts being presented out of context. <clears throat> well, the, el the elements of the bill that I have highlighted are in a way representative of that. All consultancy were called on to consult with survivors, many of whom had to add to their orig original testimonies as the Commission of Investigation misrepresented the original accounts, questioned their veracity, or laid them aside. Much in the same way, the recommendations that were obtained from the accounts repeatedly given by some survivors have been ignored in this bill. Survivors engaged with good faith in many cases, relived the trauma they went through, yet their testimonies were either misrepresented or dismissed. Yet a request to appoint a human rights expert to examine testimony given to the Commission of Investigation has been refused. That is totally unacceptable. The lack of tr trust in the process that survivors have developed over the years must be addressed. You have an opportunity now, Minister, to do this. And while I thank the Minister for the attention he has given to the survivors of Shan Ross, which is in my own constituency, I would strongly urge him not to leave this bill as it is. Before I conclude, I want to refer to two further issues. There are numerous questions that survivors have about the payments that a select number will receive. <clears throat> Given the age of many of the survivors, there are concerns that if the process is, is too onerous or lengthy, some may not live to receive those payments. What timescale can we expect? And if someone does pass away before they receive their entitlements, will they be passed on to the surviving family? And to conclude, I urge the Minister to see this discussion as an opportunity to do what is right. From my engagement with you, Minister, and I know you want to do what is right. 
So whatever or whoever is holding you back, I urge you to resist and bring sense and common and compassion into play here. And just to echo uh, Deputy Function, there has to be a massive push put on the religious order and pharmaceutical companies to uh, make the payments and give uh, the redress and give these survivors what they actually deserve. Go on, Margaret. In my office, I'm trying to crystallise my thoughts around uh, this uh, debate uh, today because there, there's, there's just so much information before us to try and analyse uh, that it, it's very hard to encapsulate it uh, within a, a, re a reasonably short debate such as we have here today. But I am grateful for the opportunity to speak to the debate nonetheless. Um, but I'm, I think we're fortunate as, as TDs that there are many people outside of these walls who are willing to provide us with uh, excellent uh, research uh, and resources. Uh, and last night as I was sitting in my office and my inbox popped uh, a paper from the Irish Council of Civil Liberties. And with your permission, Chair, I propose to read this into the record because I think for me it crystallises all of the issues and all of the flaws that are inherent within this legislation, if I may do so. It's the Irish Council for Civil Liberties briefing paper on the Mother and Baby Institutions Payment Scheme Bill. I'm quoting entirely the document here in the short time that I've available to me. Survivors challenged the final report of the Mother and Baby Homes Commission of Investigation in the High Court by arguing that the Commission failed to adhere to the legislation that established it and that their rights under the Constitution and the European Convention on Human Rights had been breached. A settlement was reached whereby the State consented to a declaration that the Commission acted in breach of statutory duty. A statement was also agreed which recognised that survivors, quote, do not accept the accounts given in the final report as a true and full reflection of the oral and documentary evidence uh, they gave, end of quote. And this is followed by a list of 64 paragraphs which can no longer be relied on. The state has expressed that the redress scheme is a part of the measure being used in, quote, responding to the report, end of quote. ICCL is concerned that the redress scheme is therefore based on a report which the state itself uh, agreed was flawed. The final report, that's the Commission report, omitted survivors' testimony and drew conclusions that do not align with survivors' testimony. For example, in this is section 2, part A of the ICCL report, there was no evidence that the women who gave birth were denied pain relief. And that's in the executive summary, paragraph 245, and that there was, quote, no evidence. And these are all the words of the Commission report now, let me, you know, be clear, uh, that at the time of adoption, women thought their consent was not full, free and informed. And that was in the executive summary, paragraph 254. Again, the report says mothers were not incarcerated in the strict meaning of the word that certain evidence was merely, quote, the product of a creative writing class. The, 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 this is the atmosphere in which we're seeking to promulgate this legislation, Alas Concorda. On the proposed independent review, the ICCL report, I mean, it's a damning report. On the 2nd of June 2021, it was reported that the vast majority of evidence given by survivors, those who gave evidence to the Confidential Committee, was effectively not considered for the final report. This led to the proposal from the Department of Children for a review of survivor testimony. However, the Minister recently announced, and this was quoted in the Irish Examiner, uh, due to the work of Elaine Lachlan and Colonel Faherta, uh, that Minister O'Gorman recently announced that this would not proceed due to, quote, significant legal complexities. And these have not been adequately identified, according to the ICCL. Problems with the Mother and Baby Homes Institu Institutions Payment Bill 2022. The Mother and Baby Homes, uh, we call it the bill, omits over 40% of survivors, including children who spent less than six months in an institution and those who were boarded out. The six month requirement is arbitrary and permits no consideration of context. A child resident for 180 days receives 12,500 euros and a child resident for 179 days receives nothing at all. 
The bill makes it more difficult for survivors who resided in an institution at a young age to claim compensation, whereas the general scheme of the bill, which the committee considered, uh, allowed child survivors to claim a payment if they were or had reasonable grounds for suspecting they were residents. The bill only allows a child to claim who was resident, very specific language. For children who may have no documentary evidence of their residence, this sets the standard of proof too high. The bill provides no compensation for forced and illegal adoptions, forced labour, unlawful vaccine trials to which Deputy Function has referred and we all have referred to in this House as, as members of the opposition. We want clarity in respect of GSK. We have been very adamant about that. We feel as if GSK have been left off the hook and the Minister has not, and I say this respectfully, the Minister has not adequately, the State has not adequately addressed the issue of the, the vaccine trials. That is a sword of Damocles, as I've said, hanging over us, uh, and it needs to be addressed. But the bill provides no compensation for forced and illegal adoptions, forced labour, unlawful vaccine trials, abuse as an adopted uh, child, and death. Nor does the bill provide compensation for discrimination, whether based on gender, disability, or race. The latter issue of systemic racism in institutions was recently highlighted as a serious gap in this bill by UN Special Rapporteurs. The term, again in the bill, work-related payment used by the bill does not adequately describe lived experiences. It should properly be described as forced labour. The levels of payment provided by the bill in respect of the uh, work-related payment are inadequate. They must correspond to the wages that survivors should have earned at the time and be linked to the average industrial uh, wage. The bill does not count, quote again, temporary absence of 180 days or more. There is no room for context. A survivor may have excellent reasons for having left the institution and returning. For example, a survivor may have escaped for 181 days before being caught and returned. That period of 181 days could not reasonably be separated from their time in the institution. This is the language we're dealing with. These are the this is the context in which this bill is being put before us. This is how serious it is. The enhanced medical card proposed in the general scheme has been replaced by a health services without charge and is available for anyone resident for 180 days. This residency requirement is arbitrary and should be removed. And we are all ad idem in opposition, I think, in respect of that very point. The zero to six months is, is just too arbitrary. Survivors resident outside of Ireland are entitled to a payment of €3,000 instead of a health services uh, card without charge, and this figure is far too low and is not reflective of the value of the services available to those receiving health services without charge. Survivors have called specifically for a trauma-informed counselling uh, and, and therapies uh, and this is not provided for in the bill, and there is no requirement in the bill that those charged to administer the redress scheme must be qualified for the position and be subject to ongoing training in international human rights law and trauma-enforced uh, responses to gross human rights violations. The Minister says that it's, this is, legislation is grounded in, in, in human rights law. Uh, you know, I think that's open to interpretation and it's open to a critique quite frankly, because the, the, the idea of putting in deciding officers within uh, the department itself is something that we'll visit again at committee stage, but I think that's something that requires further interrogation. Uh, I, I'm not convinced that that's the right way to go. We in the Labour Party are not convinced that that's the right way to go. Additionally, the bill states that a survivor will be entitled to no compensation where they have, quote, received an award from a court or settlement in respect of an action arising out of any circumstances relating to the same period of residence uh, in the institution. This provision does not take into account the possibility of a court awarding a survivor a lower amount of compensation than they would receive under the bill. Moreover, court proceedings may not necessarily be directed towards the state, yet the bill precludes such an individual from later claiming compensation from the state. Again, that is a serious, serious flaw in the bill, and we will seek to uh, amend that, but we will 
Our amendments, I anticipate now, will be ruled out of order because of the rules that apply in relation to uh, such amendments. But we, will, we ask the Minister to reconsider that very provision in, as I understand it, uh, Section 27 uh, of the Bill, Paragraph 3. That will have to be dealt with, I would contend, the last concorda. Payments uh, rates under heading uh, Head 11 should be amended to remedy the failure to offer payments to all survivors and to adequately compensate those who receive payments in line with inter alia, the current personal injuries guidelines and other comparable schemes. This includes PTSD payments under the guidelines, moderate PTSD equates to compensation of 10,000 to 35,000 euros, euros, whereas serious PTSD uh, equates to 35,000 to 80,000 euros. The bill does not require that free legal aid be made available to all applicants in circumstances where legal aid is likely to be required in applying for compensation, reviewing or appealing a determination and in swearing an affidavit that could be required of them. And this should be provided for. So that's, that, that is the Irish Council of Civil Liberties position on this bill, all of which I agree with. Uh, and it's, it's a perfect crystallisation of the issues that we're dealing with here. In respect of our attempts now to amend the bill to reflect the, the, the thoughts and aspirations of people, the many people who have been in contact with us, we will seek now to put forward an amendment in relation to seeking a report on the operation of the scheme. And in putting forward that amendment, we will seek to highlight the flaws in this bill on the basis that we will seek the report asking whether and to what extent persons engaged in the management, administration or operation of relevant institutions should be permitted or required to contribute to the cost of making payments under this Act, because that highlights the flaw in relation to uh, parties who are not party, if you will, to the redress scheme. And again, GSK looms large in terms of our thinking there. Whether the 180 days residence requirement provided for in section 13.1 uh, and 4 should be amended or repealed. Whether the scheme should be extended so as to make provision for recognising persons who were boarded out as children, as relevant persons whether there is a need to provide for additional institutions in Schedule 1 of the Bill, because we feel not, it's not an all-encompassing Bill in that regard, whether the requirement imposed on applicants by Section 27.3 uh, should be removed. And let me state what Section 27.3 is. An applicant who receives a payment under subsection 1A or the personal representative of a person in respect of whom a payment is made under subsection 1 uh, shall not institute civil proceedings and shall discontinue any other proceedings instituted by or on behalf of the applicant against a public body that arise out of the same or substantially the same circumstances as the circumstances to which the application concerned uh, related. What you're basically saying is if you get money under this scheme, you have no recourse to, you know, in order to sign the, the bottom line to, to, to get your money and redress and compensation, you're disparaging yourself from any further action on the same issue. That's essentially what, as I understand it, is what the Minister is saying and has proscribed, prescribed in this legislation. The Irish Council of Civil Liberties, as I've already said, uh, you know, are, are speaking to this point, and there are a number of solicitors uh, who have been in touch with us who are very concerned about uh, the perception that this bill creates that people will not have access to the legal advice that is entitled to every citizen on any matter of law uh, before them, and particularly in circumstances like this, where people will need advocates, uh, and we will act as advocates as TDs for people, but I'm not a lawyer, and there will be times when people will want to interface and may seek to take further action, as I think should be their right in civil proceedings, uh, and they should not be proscribed from doing that. I, I, I want to speak specifically then to the, the human rights uh, element of it in relation to the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. 
the minister speaks to the fact that you know he took on board, if I'm interpreting him correctly, the the uh, the, the, the the paper that was uh, drafted by them or published by them. But I just want to quote again from the IHREC. Uh, and, and their advisory paper stated that the Commission of Investigation, I'm quoting here, report was also limited in terms of the institutions that it covered. I've said that already. In the past, the exclusion of certain institutions in Ireland has created a barrier to seeking recourse to any meaningful reparation for survivors, despite having been subjected to serious harm. And recent research from Queen's University, uh, from Queen's University identifies the difficulties of relying on previous investigations to inform the scope of reparation schemes and which resulted in excluding certain institutions. Uh, refusing redress for these victims or basing redress on the same assumptions and availability of evidence already collected through investigations create, creates a hierarchy of victims. Silencing those at other institutions and compromising the efficacy uh, of the redress scheme overall. That's, that's a glaring point that hasn't been addressed in this. And we cannot have that hierarchy. For too long on this island, there's been a hierarchy of victims. And we can have no more of that, Minister, I respectfully uh, contend. And again, from Mr Spicer, a solicitor who corresponded with us, and I quote, the Minister, quite worryingly, seems to indicate that it would be sufficient to have a staff in his own department handle the many thousands of inquiries. This is not only impractical in terms of the logistical capabilities of having a handful of staff handling tens of thousands of calls. Uh, it lacks basic independence and it would be entirely inappropriate for the minister's own staff to be advising service users on their rights, uh, commenting on whether they should apply to the scheme, helping our community to weigh up the pros and cons of the scheme or anything else that the community need help with in terms of putting their applications together. Now, I, I think it's fair comment to say that given the experience of survivors in relation to the Commission report, to now again expect the same, those people, the people we represent, to now interface with the Minister's department and to expect them to have confidence in that process. It, it, they just do not have confidence and they want to be able to deal with somebody who is independent and who is verifiably uh, independent. The community can not, again Mr Spicer, uh, the community cannot be led with their hands held by the state to accept this redress without independent legal advice forming part of the decision making process should the applicant so wish. Uh, this scheme has to operate with complete transparency and fairness and part of that process is the right to consult with a chosen and trusted legal representative. Not only on the scheme itself, but also in consideration of the individual's own lived experiences and balancing that with the provisions in the scheme. Applicants, therefore, must feel that they can voice their concerns and be given feedback in a confidential setting with their trusted legal representative. So, in essence, Minister, uh, I understand the Minister's genuine attempts to formulate a scheme here. I understand that. But the legislation before us, as it's constituted, does not deal adequately with a whole raft of issues that remain outstanding. Uh, and I would hope that the minister would be of a mind to introduce amendments to his own legislation at committee stage, which would deal with particularly uh, uh, section uh, 27 and section 3 in relation to you know, the right uh, to further civil proceedings if, if an applicant so wishes, where they are deemed to have already uh, received compensation or redress. And I, and I also believe strongly that the issue of the zero to six months, if, if that isn't dealt with, then the legislation disregards so many people. And I asked previously on the record of the House here, I asked of the Minister what analysis had the Minister and his department officials taken out uh, of, uh, had, what analysis had the Minister and his officials done of the number of people from zero to six who could, zero to six months, who could potentially form part of this scheme, whether or not 
that that was, one, quantifiable, and if it was, what would the additional cost of that have been to the scheme? Because I believe that there are, there are people, and there's been a weight of evidence given to us on this already. The Minister will be well aware of this. But it, it, it's just too arbitrary to include people from zero to six months of age from the scheme. Again, I'm asking the Minister respectfully to please reconsider that, uh, because it seems to me that the reason for it is, is that I think that some analysis has been done on the cost of this, and I think that the analysis is such that the government have decided it would be too costly to add that onto the 800 million budget line that's already been ascribed for this, and therefore they've taken an arbitrary decision. I apologise, I'm out of time. I, we will revisit a lot of these issues at committee stage. Thank you. Moving on, back to the real I am grateful for the opportunity to discuss this piece of legislation which has been so long awaited by so many people. It follows years of activism by survivors of mother and baby home institutions to get recognition and redress that they so badly deserve. The really critical need for this legislation has been recognised by all political parties, all stakeholders and all groups. And I want to welcome the work you, Minister, and your department have done on this legislation and on making it such a key priority for this government. We've heard the testimonies, we've heard the horror stories. And that's evidence of Ireland's long and dark history of illegal and forced adoptions and we must shine a light on that dark corner of Irish history. Babies taken from their mother's arms, children growing up with no knowledge of their origins of their family history, and young women so cruelly institutionalised. And for so many of those women, it's not history, it's their present. Because still today, they are enduring the trauma that they suffered the hands of the church and the state at such an early age in their life. And that suffering has, for many people, had a profound impact on their health, their well-being, their ability to work, their ability to lead an ordinary life. I don't know, Minister, what financial price can be put on that level of trauma. I mean, how do we repay a woman who had her child taken from her and illegally adopted, perhaps never to be seen again. Or a child born into such harrowing circumstances who grew up without all of the information that they should have had about who they are. I don't know how we quantify that. Because in reality, we know that no amount of financial redress will ever remedy the unspeakable damage and the abuse that so many women and children suffered even the largest sum of money would pale into insignificance. But I know this legislation aims to help, and the financial redress and access to medical cards and the support that these women and their children born into institutions will get. We know that many women who were institutionalised in mother and baby homes are growing older. They have lived long lives. Some have poor health, and we simply can't make them wait any longer for financial redress. And that's why it is so critical that we ensure redress is given as soon as possible. Because these women and their children, many, mostly adults now, they need our support. This legislation will mean that all mothers who spend time in a mother and baby institution will receive financial redress, the amount of, uh, the amount of redress increasing based on their length of stay. And all children who spent six months or more in an institution will receive financial redress based on their length of stay. An additional work-related payment for women resident in certain institutions for more than three months who undertook what might be termed commercial work will come into play. An enhanced medical card will be available to everybody who was a resident in a mother or baby home or county home institution for six months or more. But Minister, I must say, I do take issue with the exclusion of those boarded out and children born in mother and baby homes who spent less than six months in these institutions. I know that in every scheme and in every policy we have to set parameters, but I find that six months hard to justify. 
I was recently contacted by someone born in a mother and baby home who spent less than six months there. But this person's life has been greatly impacted by that cruel entry into the world. And they are so hurt that they won't be included in this scheme and they feel excluded again. And I have to say, all I can do for that person is agree with them and, and take this opportunity, Minister, to urge you to please keep this aspect of legislation under review. I really do want to commend you, Minister, and indeed the state for taking responsibility for the provision of redress. But I do also want to put on the record that I find it so disappointing and so frustrating that religious institutions will not be contributing towards redress. Religious organisations who themselves have apologised and accepted their responsibility for the unforgivable trauma and abuse inflicted on mothers and babies won't be contributing to the redress. And that's angering. That's angering for many people. Minister, I know your intentions in this bill are only good. You and your department have not been set an easy task, but it's one you must fulfil. And I thank you for your leadership and your dedication to ensuring that that happens. And I'd like to end with a line from correspondence sent to me just this week by a survivor. Protecting, valuing and recognising trauma of survivors and victims now, properly and compassionately, would heal some pain. Because maybe nothing was done to stop it happening then, but something can be done to ease the damage now. Minister, I've had many emails and phone calls from survivors of our mother and baby homes over the past few weeks, and the survivors are understandably angry about some of the provisions of this bill. While we in Sinn Féin support the introduction of a redress scheme for survivors of mother and baby and county homes, it must be one that is inclusive, based on human rights and equality standards. There are serious concerns in regard to the exclusion of children who are resident uh, in these homes for less than six months. People feel that it has been deliberately formulated to exclude approximately 24,000 survivors, mostly consistent of these children who were residents for less than six months. And that the government's plan is all about reducing costs and reducing liability. What it should be about is creating equality, fairness, and ensuring that all survivors are adequately compensated for any time spent in one of these horrific uh, institutions. Minister, earlier this week I spoke to a man who was born in one of these institutions. He spent a short time there before being adopted to a family in the west of Ireland where he had a happy childhood. He learned in later life that he was adopted and when he went looking for his mother he found she had died the previous year. He has since connected with her wider family but feels cheated out of the chance to know his mother. He rightly blames the state who were complicit in his forced adoption. I also spoke to this man's son and he told me he feels an intergenerational sense of loss, of shame and of anger and the consequences of the state's action and inaction run deep. In 2013, former Taoiseach Enda Kenny apologised to the Magdalene Laundry survivors. A couple of sentences that struck out of his speech for me was where he said, the value of any sincere apology is always found in the actions that follow. He went on to say, the last thing that survivors need is inadequate apologies from more men in positions of power. They deserve justice, genuine contrition from the church and state and complete and unreserved redress. Those were his words, Minister, not mine. That is what they deserve, but this bill falls far short. It is a further abuse of the survivors and their families who have already suffered too much. And Minister, could you please show some compassion? Widen the scheme, increase the compensation and remove the legal waiver, which the UN has also called for. Give these people what they deserve. They have suffered enough and it's time to act now. Thank you, Las Cancorla. Thank you, Las Um The scale of abuse, terror and cruelty experienced by thousands of women, children and infants in mother and baby homes is almost unimaginable. Unexplained infant deaths, disappeared children, illegal adoptions, incarceration, forced labour, illegal medical experimentation, and emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. 
Both the church and state have responsibility for these abuses and their legacy. The religious orders and pharmaceutical companies must be held to account and pay their share. The extent of harm cannot be quantified. The stigma that followed people all their lives, the psychological impact of losing the parent-child bond, the weight of never knowing what happened to your child, the intergenerational trauma. No redress scheme could adequately compensate survivors, but the government's proposed scheme is shamefully minimal, exclusionary, and it's insulting. Despite the wishes of survivors and the recommendations of UN human rights bodies, Minister, you're seemingly determined to push ahead with deeply deficient and even offensive reparation. With no evidence basis and purposely going against clinical experts and survivors, people who spent less than six months in homes as children are excluded. People who suffered illegal adoptions, medical trials, and who were boarded out will get nothing. Over 24,000 people will not be eligible. Those who the minister deems worthy of compensation will receive as little as 5,000 euro. For many people, it's not about the money, but that cannot be used as a defence for such an insultingly low figure. This disgraceful scheme is being done in the name of the Irish people, and I have not met one person who is not outraged by your plans. There's still time to do the right thing, to enable all survivors to access redress, and to hold church and pharmaceutical companies to account. It's difficult to catalogue the defects in this scheme, but the overarching philosophy is to award as little as possible and to grant that to as few people as possible. This principle is obvious in the bill, but some of the particulars were reported by Jennifer Bray in the Irish Times earlier this year. Documents from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform warned that extending the scheme would, and I quote, create a significant precedent regarding claims from many others in society who may feel they're also entitled to some form of redress or recognition payment based on any length of residency or attendance in an institution or other setting. That is the reality behind this scheme, the true priorities. Minister, it's clear you either have a lack of will or capacity to overrule them. I think there's a general feeling that you were left holding the bag. But are you willing to put your name to this? You seem to have decided it is good enough to stand over, and so you must be held accountable. Another tactic used is to claim you are going beyond the deeply flawed Commission's report. It is obvious and painful inaccuracies that basically absolved the church and state of responsibility, blaming society instead. This is blatantly untrue, and it is disgraceful that the government is willing to cling to this as the definitive record. Minister, you had initially committed to providing an independent review of the testimony given to the Commission. In August, survivors learned from the examiner that you were abandoning that plan. In December last year, we had the High Court declaration that the Commission wrongly denied eight survivors their statutory right to comment on many draft findings. The Commission themselves are unwilling to explain their methodology and findings at Oireachtas committees, as they know full well their conduct and report is indefensible. Their recommendations are arbitrary, ill-founded and punitive. Minister, when you say you're going beyond the Commission's recommendations, I hope you realise how hollow and disrespectful those words are. There are several major issues in the bill that ignore the wishes of survivors, human rights experts, and the recommendations of the Children's Committee. Firstly, the purposeful exclusion of whole categories of survivor. survivors. This is manifested in two ways, primarily. People who, as children, spent less than six months in institutions, and then disregarding whole categories of abuse such as forced family separation and illegal medical trials. The disregard for those who were born and spent time in mother and baby homes is highly immoral. It's disgusting that people are being denied any form of recognition because of frankly ignorant and hurtful statements from the minister and officials in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. 
Minister, ignoring all psychological and developmental evidence, you claimed children who were in for less than six months would not have been aware of their experiences, would have been too young to remember their experiences. Besides being a reprehensible statement in this context, it's also factually inaccurate that the Minister for Children is disregarding the central role of the first six months of a child's life for their development is wrong on so many levels. Minister, when you announced this scheme last year, over 30 clinical experts wrote to you stating that childhood trauma has the greatest impact early on in childhood. These experts pointed out that there is no threshold of time linked to this trauma and as a result, having an arbitrary period of six months exposure is simply that, arbitrary. All children who are subjected to this cruel system deserve acknowledgement and they deserve redress. That is the absolute bare minimum. Officials in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform dismissed the experiences and trauma of this group of survivors because they would likely have gone on to live comfortable and contented lives. Not only is that just made up, it's wholly ignorant of all we know about mother and baby homes, the trauma and stigma, stigma that followed people for all of their lives. The exclusion is based on a dehumanising position that shows this government has no interest in evidence or lived experience. The disregard for the wishes of survivors further demonstrates this point. Minister, you commissioned the Oak Report. You presented it as a chance for survivors to have their voice heard in shaping the redress scheme. It's especially callous to ask survivors for their input, only for you to then go away and reject it. Survivors participated in good faith, shared their experience and opinions, again, only for you to ignore them. That is unforgivable. The consultation was just a tick box exercise for the minister and the department. The lives and experience of survivors are just a bureaucratic exercise to be thrown aside. I want to quote some sections from the report to ensure that they are on the dull record, for the people to understand how the minister is simply ignoring survivors. Here are two excerpts from the executive summary on page nine. Many survivors stated that the recommendations were inappropriate, that eligibility criteria were arbitrary, and lacked an acceptance of the reality and the conditions in the home. And, quote again, the largest proportion of written submissions stated that all mothers and babies who resided in mother and baby homes should be eligible for redress, regardless of the duration or year of their stay, and regardless of whether children were accompanied or unaccompanied by their mothers. On that same page, there's a direct quote from a survivor too. I think it's disingenuous of the government to place an arbitrary six-month redress restriction on residents. From a neurobiological perspective, the damage done to an infant is catastrophic. It is a cop-out not to include human rights. The state has failed us. It's in there in black and white. There is no ambiguity. The survivors are clear. Clinicians are clear. The evidence is clear. The Children's Committee recommendation was very strong on this issue based on our engagement with survivors, their advocates, and human rights experts. We required that the six-month residency requirement must be removed. Anyone who is resident in one of the institutions should be entitled to a payment, regardless of the time spent therein. Minister, when I and others put forward amendments to remove this deeply insulting exclusion, will you defend it each time? Would you claim giving people access to their personal information is all they wanted every time? Or more worryingly, will you use the money message excuse to rule us out of order? The six-month exclusion has to go. It should never have been there in the first place. The second way the government is excluding survivors is by dismissing abuses, most prominently forced family separation and illegal adoptions. The practice of being boarded out, forced labour, and illegal medical trials. Here the government has cobbled together different and equally pathetic excuses to deny any form of restitution for the harm caused by the state, church and pharmaceutical companies. 
the flawed Commission's findings are used as a rationale. Individuals are being told that the experimentation they never consented to, one of the most basic tenets of medical science, is a matter for them to take up with the pharmaceutical companies, as if the church and state didn't facilitate them. This group must be included in the scheme and the state should pursue pharmaceutical giants. Adopted people and the survivors of forced family separation, one of the worst crimes imaginable, have been neglected in this process. They were not included in the terms of the Commission, meaning there is no official recognition, um, and they've yet to even receive a proper state apology. Recently in the Shannon, the Minister gave an attempt at an apology with a handful of survivors invited. The whole incident revealed the government's priorities rather than meaningfully recognising the abuses and crimes involved. The Oak Report, as I mentioned, stressed that all survivors should be included. The principle incorporates these groups. But in case there was any doubt, it is specifically stated that, and I quote again from the executive summary, eligibility would be further extended to include those subjected to coercive family separation outside institutions or who are legally adopted, fostered, boarded out without adequate supervision and vetting. To do otherwise, it was stated, would undermine the legitimacy of the scheme and failed to deliver a survivor-centred response focused on the nature and effects of the harm suffered by survivors. The Children's Committee, aware of the Minister's treatment of survivors, firmly supported them in our recommendation that the scheme recognises all rights violations and harms perpetuated in the institutional and family separation system, including but not limited to those identified by the Oak Report. The Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission have strongly called for a broadening of the scheme as recognition for the range and scale of abuses in these state-run or financed institutions. In addition, there is a mountain of recommendations from UN human rights experts that the government is ignoring, hoping that the average person is not aware of them. I can only list some of the many findings. A joint letter from six UN special rapporteurs in November 2022 said that as illegal adoption may come within the legal definition of trafficking in persons, it is critical that the redress scheme establishes a process for effective investigations and ensures access to effective remedies to all victims without exception. In July, the UN Human Rights Committee called for the state to fully recognise the violation of human rights of all victims in these institutions and provide redress. In September, UN human rights experts called for redress for victims of racial discrimination and systematic racism in Irish childcare institutions. This point is important and often overlooked. Misogyny, classism, racism and other forms of discrimination were inherent in these cruel systems. Women and children from poorer families were often treated worst. Children with mixed heritages were abused. Travellers and disabled people were also targeted. An important part of transitional justice is recognition. It's truth-telling. That is not just memorialisation. It needs to be in the legislation. The Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission was clear on this, as were others. The legislation should outline the range of abuses and human rights violations. These should be listed and every survivor should be compensated. The scale of people currently excluded from the scheme is shocking and the amount of abuse not recognised is shameful. The next major issue is the disgracefully low compensation. We know for some survivors it's not about money, but acknowledgement and some help with living costs and medical expenses. All the UN bodies have called for proper compensation the Children's Committee, based on engagement with survivors and others, have called for an increase in the payment amounts for HHAA medical cards, for tailored trauma-informed counselling supports and for legal aid to enable survivors to seek independent advice at every stage. Some survivors will get as little as €5,000, Minister, that is truly pathetic. While no form of redress could adequately compensate survivors, that cannot be used as an excuse to grant paltry amounts 
It's a pathetic excuse and you know it. Thirdly, a legal waiver remains under the terms of the general payment or work-related payment in Section 26. The UN Human Rights Committee, UN Human Rights Experts and the Children's Committee have all called for the removal of legal waivers. Those who apply for redress should not be gagged or restricted from taking separate legal action. Again, it's an attempt to control survivors, to prevent them from even thinking of seeking more redress uh, than the small amounts that you've decided that they can get. Another significant issue is the lack of interim payments. And again, this is another matter that survivors were very clear on. The Oak Report states, most commonly held view in relation to financial recognition was that an immediate interim ex gratia common experience payment should be paid as ur urgently as possible. This was particularly in the case bearing in mind the older age profile of survivors who it was thought should be prioritised, as well as those suffering serious illness or other extreme circumstances. Not only was an interim payment system the obvious and right thing to do, you've had this report since May last year. So for 17 months, you've done nothing on that vital issue. Unfortunately, I have to say that the cold reality is some people have already passed away and never received any form of, comp of compensation due to this inaction. Finally, there is the matter of accountability. This is something survivors want. This is something the public wants. And UN committees have asked for. Why are the church and pharmaceutical companies not being held accountable? The minister is apparently in negotiations with religious orders to contribute to the cost of redress. This should not be a subject for negotiations. From the government perspective, you should be seizing assets. These orders profited from crimes, from forced labour, from child trafficking. We have laws to rightly seize proceedings of illegality. If a gang carried out these crimes, there would be no hesitation. But because it's the church, government parties wouldn't dare. The conduct of these so-called Christian organisations is shameful. If the religious orders had any credibility, they would hand over assets in contrition. Their hypocrisy is obvious. And the government is making no effort to hold pharmaceutical companies accountable either. Not to mind any form of legal culpability, we've basically given up on the idea that anyone will ever be prosecuted for these crimes. It's clear from its conception, this scheme was not designed with the preferences of survivors or human rights standards in mind. It was shaped by financial concerns and the government's philosophy of doing just enough to look good, just enough for the headlines. This bill intentionally excludes over 20,000 survivors. It willfully ignores human rights violations and crimes, and it ignores the minister's own consultation and numerous UN human rights bodies. It is frankly disgraceful and insulting. It's another stain on how Ireland has treated a group of people who have suffered countless abuses people who have suffered enough. And you know it, and your colleagues know it. It is clear from the number of government speaking slots that no one turns up to speak for. While many were eager to speak on the eviction ban and the energy bill, where are they today? Just one who criticised a lot of the bill. Last week, none. They know this is a hollow, offensive scheme, but will they vote for it? I'm calling for a vote of conscience on this controversial bill. I know many backbenchers are deeply uncomfortable with this bill. And if the minister is so confident that he's doing the right thing, would you allow a free vote? Many survivors have spoken out already, while others, understandably, are just too tired now. They've been worn down by the state and successive governments for years, and now this one too. I, along with others on the opposition benches, will do what we can. I'll be putting forward amendments to address the most egregious aspects of this bill at every single stage. 
I have no doubt that you will disregard them, just as you have disregarded survivors and human rights experts. But at least the will of the people will be presented. People want justice for survivors. They want a proper scheme that recognises the harm caused. The government certainly does not represent Irish society on this. And it will be on the record that at least there was some public representatives who spoke up. It's not too late, Minister. The decision is yours. Thank you, Deputy. Um, Deputy Rory Merkel. Um, Gurum Aigat Kahirluk. Um, Minister, look, we all know this state has a very long history. We had a society that was built around not giving adequate powers and protections to women and beyond that actually oppressing them. And, and I accept that a significant amount of legacy issues have fallen in your entry. I, I assume others didn't want to deal with them. Um, and look, we are at the point of redress and we all accept and we all support the need for a redress scheme, particularly for um, those in mother and baby homes. But I, I think it's fair to say that we're dealing with um, a cohort of people who have been absolutely failed over many years, even in, la in uh, latter times. We have heard about the issues in relation to the testimonies not considered, the leaks, all those other issues which just heap pain upon pain. Um, and the fact is you are dealing with a huge cohort of people who feel that they have been betrayed and left to one side by this state and that the fact is there is a considerable amount of people, I think it's in around 24,000 and probably beyond, um, that now definitely feel that they absolutely are, are not getting any element of even delayed um, justice. And, and look, just to put this in some sort of general framework, uh, Loud County Council on the back of two motions by uh, Loud County Councillors, that's Sinn Féin's Joanna Byrne, and John Sheridan, uh, Dennis Cahillan wrote up a piece about Loud County Council's uh, historic responsibility or involvement in the mother and uh, baby homes. And I'll just, I'm just going to read out two pieces. Uh, women from County Loud were placed in mother and baby homes throughout the country. It is impossible to state accurately how many of the mothers and children in homes uh, were from County Loud. Information on admissions practices incomplete. Women would have been referred by clergy, medical and nursing personnel, public officials or family members. Absolutely um, with no element of power in, in, their, in their grasp. And then, many pregnancies arose from incest, statutory rape or other exploitative situations. And I think that that's what we have to accept. We have to accept that a huge amount of women were absolutely powerless. Um, all did nothing wrong. Many found themselves in exploitative situations because of the huge power differential that was in society and the great and good at best did nothing to improve that set of circumstances. And we are looking to address this. And I think it's fair to say that the idea of removing those people who were less than six months uh, resident in these homes just doesn't wash. We, we all accept that, there, uh, that these people went through a huge level of pain. That's before we start talking about the failures in relation by the pharmaceutical companies and the clergy. But Minister, you have the power to deliver what is a small modicum of justice for these people who have been too long without it. And I think we all need you to do that. Thanks. Uh, Deputy Catherine Conley. Hey, Margaret and um, It is significant that quite a number of TDs have ignored their slots for speaking. Um, i leave it at that in relation to such an important topic. You say in your speech, Minister, the scheme will recognise the time spent and the harsh conditions, emotional abuse and other forms of mistreatment, stigma and trauma experienced by people while resident in a county, a mother and baby or county home. What's missing there is some people, you know, some people. And it will recognise some damage and it will recognise some institutions, and it will give some money. And it's very important, very important, because let's look at the context of how we're speaking, and I'm glad I have an extra time in the slot that I have to, to elaborate a little bit on this. Let's see where we've come from today. I think it was 2012, which is 10 years ago, that Catherine Corliss, local human rights activist and historian, started into our old family tree and then began to discover
different things and we're extremely grateful to her. That's 10 years ago, I think, if my sums are right, and I'll come back to her. Prior to that, we had many, many indications for many different places that something was very wrong. I come from a city of institutions. I come from Galway City. We had the Magdalene Laundry within a stone's throw of my house. We had the Lenaby Industrial School for Girls. We had the Industrial School for Boys and St. Joseph's Brothers and Sisters. I'm aware of that personally. Sisters here, brothers here, never to see each other again, within less than a half a mile from each other. Then we go out to Connemara and we had Lenaby Industrial School for Boys. And in Clifton we had the Industrial School for Girls. I haven't touched the mother and baby home in Toom, Loch Grey, a city and a county of institutions all over the country. And what was that minister? It was part of the architecture of containment, the phrase used so eloquently by Professor Smith from Boston University, as I understand it, the architecture of containment. And we're now 100 years. The last day I read out um, uh, in recognition of our first constitution, and 100 years later, we're looking back at a century of containment, mostly of women, but also boys and girls and men. Every institution was full. For what purpose? for a so-called morality. And various people in society functioned as morality police. We talk about Iran today. I have a great understanding of the morality police because that's what we had in Ireland when it came to women, done very subtly. So we knew from um, the 1997 Banished Babies, we knew from the work of Mary Raftery, we knew work from so many people, most of all, ye, and not you personally, but the departments knew, because they have the key to all of the data that's there, that tells the story. And so, into this thing comes Catherine Corliss, courageous, determined, fearless, and she goes forward and identifies what the inappropriate burials of 798 children in June. And what does she face? Let's look at what she faces. She tries she tries and she tries. And the response from the nuns, and I've read this out before actually, through Terry Prone, and she talks about the letters she got in relation to the, uh, um, well, let me just be specific. Catherine Carlish published her article, The Home, in the Journal of the Old Tomb Society, 2012, detailing the very poor conditions and so on. Not much attention was paid to that. Then she goes forward and between 2011 and 13, at her own expense, she gets 798 debt records. Denise McNamara in the Connick Tribune publishes an article on the 13th of February 2014 entitled Campaign to Recognise 800 Dead Babies. Were it not for the tenacity of a housewife who has spent 10 years researching her own, her own family three, the names of 798 children buried in an unmarked grave would be lost for eternity. And of course then we had the Irish Daily Mail, mass septic tank, grave containing up to 800 babies and so on. What was the response of the nuns at that point? Terry Prone, who was speaking for them, to a person who was making a documentary. What did Terry Prone say on behalf of the Bon Secure sisters? Your letter was sent to me by the provincial of the Irish Bon Secure congregation with instructions that I should help you. I'm not sure how I can. Let me explain, she said. When the, oh my God, mass grave in the west of Ireland broke in an English paper, the mail. It surprised the hell out of everyone, not least the sisters of Bon Secure in Ireland, none of whom had ever worked in Tume, and most of all, none whom had heard of it. If you come here, you'll find no mass grave. Listen to this now. If you come here, you'll find no mass grave, no evidence that children were ever so buried, and a local police force casting their eyes to heaven and saying, yeah, a few bones were found, but this was an area where famine victims were buried. Now, I read that particularly to set the scene of what Catherine Corliss and what the survivors were facing at that point. And then, of course, we had international attention. And eventually we get M.D. Kenny. And the, finally, the Commission of Inquiry is set up in February 15. And it's set up with limited terms of reference, I, I, I might say. 
It was established on the 20th of February. Interestingly then, there were eight, eight, seven interim reports. One of them, which wasn't published until the final report was published, with no explanation ever as to why it wasn't published. That was interesting and significant as well. Then we have the report submitted to the minister in the 30th of October 2020, but doesn't see the light of day. Then it's published on the 12th of January with extensive coverage in a Sunday paper. A leak, and part of that leak included comments from the Taoiseach. Can you imagine that now when trust was of the essence? It's, and it, no survivor had a copy. Then we had a webinar and the, repeatedly told they had copies, no copies. And they were to download a 3,000 page document. Then there was to be a report into the leak that we never heard of, that never came to fruition. Different TDs asked questions and we were told, like water, the leak had broadened out to hear nothing. Then we got all of the uh, reports. The fifth one is particularly significant in relation to the fifth interim report. Because when you come back to the Commission of Investigation where the caveat was put in relation to the survivor's testimony that it was contaminated, do you remember that caveat? The 550 courageous people who came forward with a caveat from the three wise people from the Commission of Investigation telling us, oh, beware here, beware, this evidence is contaminated or may be contaminated. Look, look what they say about... Let me just read out here in their fifth interim report what they say about... Um, I'll just get it now, let me for the moment while I have the time. Eight, page eight, and this is repeated. The Congregation of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary, who owned and ran three institutions, provided the Commission with an affidavit about burials generally and specifically about Castle Pollard and Sean Ross child burials, but for very little evidence provided to support the statements. The affidavit was, in many respects, speculative, inaccurate and misleading. That's repeated again on page 22. That's the, ev that's the commission telling us speculative, inaccurate and misleading. I didn't see that repeated anywhere in the final report. You might correct me if it was. And of course, they raise Hume and Bespera distinguished themselves by having no records in relation to the burials. And the commission do rise to pose the question. The more difficult question to answer is why the children were buried in such an inappropriate manner. And of course, they go through whether the chambers were used for sewage or not. And they feel obliged to clarify that they weren't. However, not highlighting the fact that there were sewage chambers where the bodies were wrapped and placed. And they point out that a concrete lid had to be lifted so that those baby bodies could be put down and so on. Now, I don't know if you've read these reports, but they're there in black and white and you say, speculative, inaccurate and misleading. There's no caveat in the final report in relation to their evidence. Instead of that, a premium is put on the accuracy of their evidence. There's also a, a, a little on the sale of bodies. The sale of bodies to the medical students or the medical department in Galway and they give the price for which the bodies were sold and how the porter sold them and the doctors received them. Worth looking at really. But I'll stay focused in relation to what we're doing today and you tell us this is human rights. This has nothing to do with human rights. This has to do with a cold calculated decision in relation to costs. That's what this is about. Um, I'm not going to waste my time to not hold it to say that you've done a good job and I believe in your bona fides because at this point we now have a very faulty bill before us based on cost containment, not on justice. And I find it insulting to be told that it's based on human rights principles. I find it absolutely insulting. It's probably my last time to have such time to talk about it because then I'm going to be absolutely blunt uh, in my comments in relation to this, not on my behalf but on behalf of Catherine Corliss, on behalf of all the brave people who have stood and tried to educate us TDs, who have taken cases to the court, who succeeded in getting an annex or another document appended to the Commission of Investigation report, setting it out, they had to go to court, two or three, and then in the background, more courageous women waiting to see it, and then there's a settlement, isn't there? And that's what's in the library now. 
very courageous people coming forward, the Clan people, Mar Maraid Enright and her colleagues. I could name them all out, Katrina Crow, all helped to educate us TDs, as well as our own gut feeling and our own work. To come forward to say, this is the time, Minister, to get it right. To make language mean something, because language has meant nothing. There was no forced incarceration, no. There was no illegal adoptions. There was no evidence of uh, the mothers of, of their consent not being taken. Imagine this is what's been said. From, and we, we, took, we listened to 550 people, and then we, we don't um, take on board what they said. Then we have the whole debacle on top of the leak in relation to the recording. You can shake your head, or you can listen, and you can learn, like we all can, because I'm no expert. But I'm certainly an expert in having read the stuff and made myself aware of what is, we're being told and what people have suffered. I, I would say I'm an expert on that at this point, only on that part. In everything else, I'm no expert. So we had the leak and then we had the whole debacle of the recorded material that wasn't recorded, that was recorded, and all of that. And then we come forward to this bill and we leave out how many people. We put the emphasis on the inclusion of approximately 34,000 people with 19,000 qualifying for an enhanced medical card, for which I'm sure they should be very grateful, really. The number who spent longer than six months is 14,507. The number that spent less than six months is 24,149. So we have excluded the vast majority of children who were in mother and baby homes on spurious grounds that they were a tabula rasa, nothing affected them, and at the end of six months they were still a tabula rasa. You've done this despite the fact that the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission has set out that this is wrong. The Irish Council for Civil Liberties, 34 clinicians working in the area of childhood trauma, simply not based on scientific evidence, not based on our experience as mothers and fathers, you've excluded all of those children. And you talk in another speech of how you cannot monetize the harm done. That's exactly what you have done. That's exactly what you're standing over, the monetization of suffering in the most narrow way possible. And then you've excluded children who were boarded out. We're going to ignore them as well, even though the interdepartmental group looked at the number there, 4,757. All of these numbers are very specific, and, and they're, not, they're, they're easy to deal with, in a sense, for a proper, just, fair redress scheme based on human rights. You've ignored the people who were illegally adopted. Do you remember the Marion Reynolds report that was never discussed in the Dáil? The woman who asked for her name to be taken off the report, as I understand it. If I'm wrong, I've asked you repeatedly to correct me. I understand that that author asked for her name to be removed from the report because of changes made by you and your department. That has never, that was a scoping exercise to see the extent of the illegal adoptions, never been dealt with. There is no redress for systematic racism, despite UN human rights experts highlighting this in correspondence. And you know this as recently as the 23rd of September. It's discriminatory, it doesn't include all relevant institutions. Remember the Commission of Investigation chose a sample number of uh, county homes and then the major mother and baby homes, not all homes, and you're proceeding with that, although there is the option there to include. You're completely ignoring the bonding, as I've said already, and I just want to refer to an email. I'm not going to say it, although I have been given permission, but I won't. But just to give an example, three children, three siblings, two were adopted at nine months, so they will come under the scheme. A third sister who was born a few years later, spent less than nine months, will not come in. Imagine that family trying to explain this to each other. The, one, the two that were adopted at nine months will come under the scheme. The third sister who got out before six months will not come under the scheme. Just, just to place it uh, in reality. Your work-related payments, it didn't work. It was forced labour. You know that. I know that. So, what I find from all the submissions from um, the human rights, survivors groups and organisations is for the first time, let's place human rights at the heart of this legislation. They asked for 
four basic principles of human rights to be enshrined so that the redress is in context. I looked at the title. It does not enshrine uh, the basic principles of human rights, which I don't have time to go into, but they've already been read out by um, Deputy Sherlock in relation to the Irish Council for Civil Liberties. So, if, why am I saying all of this? Because we've had the redress board in 2000, every 10 years actually, as it turns out, in 2003, the institution's redress board, where you had a waiver and you committed an offence, me included as a barrister at the time, if I disclose anything about the ward, that, that to, uh, still, that criminal offence is still there. Fast forward then to 2013, the Magdalen Redress Scheme. Remember the Ombudsman's report? We should learn from it. You know, what did he say? Basically, to learn from it. In order that any, he talked about the maladministration. Do you remember those words? In order to ensure that any future restorative justice or redress schemes benefit from, the, benefit from the learning, from the operation of this and other schemes, there must be guidance. There must, those documents must be open and accountable and be there. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Then the way, I was at the redress scheme in 2003 and moved forward to the Magdalene in 2013 and this scheme probably will come operational in 2023. So every 10 years in that 30 year span, that's 30 years I'm taking out of 100 year span, Minister. And what have we learned? We're still persistent with the waiver, aren't we? Now, I, 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 I pay tribute to you, you've removed the silence in relation to um, the amount of money they're going to get, which is progress. Can you imagine that? 20 years later, to take us to take that out. But you're still saying the waiver, in spite of the fact that the UN Committee Against Torture found that the waivers imposed upon Elizabeth Coppin in the, in the Residential Institution Redress Board and the Magdalene Expressia Restorative Scheme were enforceable, unenforceable. They affirmed that the state is required and so on. I haven't time. Worth looking at that. You're keeping the waiver. This, we've received STDs numerous uh, emails. One in particular said, Murrah's Fannin Lifford, why it wasn't included in the scheme. And I'm sure we're going to get many, many more. As I said, boarded out has been ignored uh, and the waiver has been ignored. Finally, in my last minute and a half, you're setting up a, a body, haven't learned nothing from Karanua and the debacle that that was and the misnaming of it as a new friend. And you're setting up another office within your office, not independent. No idea as to how the application will be made. Oral, affidavit, a, a story. There will be a review which I welcome. The review will be carried out by the deciding officer. Then there will be an appeal. And you know what? The appeal is heard. And then just to make sure that the person has no sense of the independence, the deciding officer uh, gets to tell the person what the result of the appeal was. Can you imagine that for, for, for lack of, I don't know, insight? Then we have no up-to-date on the negotiations with the religious orders and we have no update on relation to the, um, the pharmaceutical companies. Finally, two things. The legal aid that you're giving is minimalist. Minimalist in relation to two aspects. One, the waiver, and two, in relation to an affidavit. That affidavit arises where the chief deciding officer is unhappy with documentation and he needs an affidavit. The question also on the documentation, the chief deciding officer has access to the archives to make a decision. When he gets those documentation, will he make those available to the applicants? Because that would be absolutely essential if justice was to be done. Finally, outstanding correspondence with your department. For over a year to two years now, I've been asking for all of the documentation between the government, your department, and the Commission of Investigation. I tried to work with your department and narrow down the scope of it, and I have still no reply. Thank you, Deputy. Um, we're going to go to Deputy Richard Boy Barrett next, and then the Minister. But first, um, Deputy, I just ha I wish to advise the House. Um, the 12 deputies have submitted matters under Standing Order 37A, which will be delisted in the official debate. The matters raised by the following deputies have been selected for discussion. Deputy Brian Ledden to discuss rail freight development in Ireland and on the Limerick to Foynes railway line. Deputy Desi Ellis to discuss further funding for restoration and conservation work on the historic St Canice Cemetery in Finglas. And Deputy Martin Brown to discuss stone-built cottages and farmhouses and qualification for the retrofit scheme. Deputy Richard Boyd Barrett. Thanks. Um, Minister, the first one thing I want to 
do as we commence uh, or I commence my contribution on the mother and baby home redress scheme is just remind ourselves that uh, the crimes committed against, uh, by the state and church against mothers and children uh, were uh, crimes that um, we have to learn from as a society, not just in Ireland, uh, but across uh, the world. And I think, given that after a very, very long struggle by the victims of various church and state institutions that persecuted, in particular, women, children, and in particularly, working class women and children, uh, and uh, minorities, travellers, uh, children of mixed race, uh, and so on, um, it is important to see the relevance of that to current events in the world. Uh, and it would be wrong in discussing the crimes the church and state committed against women and children in this country in the aftermath of the Irish Revolution, not to mention the crimes that are being committed against uh, women uh, in Iran at the moment by the Iranian state, uh, where a systematic regime of denying women self-determination and their rights to bodily autonomy and freedom and self-determination uh, resulted in the murder of Mihasa uh, Amini 40 days ago, a young Kurdish woman, because she refused to abide by the dress code of the moral police. Um, just like we had our moral police uh, in this country who thought it was okay to incarcerate women because they didn't abide by certain religious rules, to stigmatize them, to stigmatize uh, their children, uh, we still see that happening uh, today across the world. It's not exclusive by any means to Iran, but it's happening now in Iran, uh, and we're seeing a heroic struggle of people across Iran, men and women, uh, from different ethnic backgrounds, um, coming out in protest against the brutal treatment of women who just assert the right to be themselves, to determine uh, who they are. And I think it's very important to say that uh, at the moment because there's such a strong parallel between Iran's history and Ireland's history. Um, Iran, quite rightly, uh, demands to assert its right to self-determination against the manipulation of Western powers who for many, many years uh, tried to control that region, control that state, uh, to install puppet regimes and so on. Uh, uh, very similar to the way Ireland was subject to the British Empire. Um, and then they had a revolution, just like we had a revolution um, in 1979 that overthrew a Shah that uh, declared self-determination, um, but then denies that self-determination to women. And that very strongly parallels what happened to the Irish Revolution, a revolution of great promise to liberate the Irish people from an empire, but then incarcerated women and children for decades and decades and decades and treated them as slaves, uh, as second-class citizens, uh, and so on. Uh, and it's uh, outrageous that the Iranian regime is doing that, as much as I would absolutely assert the right uh, of the people of the Middle East in Iran and elsewhere to stand up against Western manipulation of that region and indeed the hypocrisy and double standards of some of those who wish to condemn them for various things, uh, nonetheless it is shameful what the Iranian state is doing uh, and they should desist uh, and they should allow uh, women and everybody in Iran uh, the self-determination that they, they are demanding and that they are taking to the streets for. So I just feel it's, it's important to say that and to point to those parallels and maybe hope uh, that the Iranian authorities are listening and, and understanding how if self-determination isn't self-determination in every respect, you end up with what we've seen in this state, even after you were supposedly liberated uh, from empires. Um, secondly, I'd just like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, I received a, a message. This may have been said earlier in the debate, and so apologies, I wasn't here earlier. I was, had to visit somebody in the hospital. But, the, uh, uh, according to the Adoption Rights Alliance, 
the 30 day, uh, the promise to get people's um, personal information to them within the 30 days that was promised by the government is now, they are hearing reports via the Adoption Authority of Ireland at least, I'm not sure what the situation is with Tuzla, is now not going to happen. That they are, they are hearing soundings that that's not going to happen and it may be uh, more like 90 days and into January. Uh, so it would be interesting to, for the Minister to comment if he's aware of this, uh, but certainly the message I've received is of grave disappointment uh, that people are feeling after the long wait to get to this point uh, that there are now uh, apparently significant delays in people getting the information that they have requested, their personal information about their history and so on. Uh, uh, and I, I would ask the Minister to respond and indeed to do everything he can to do what's ever necessary to remedy that situation so that the promise that people would get that information uh, is uh, delivered upon. Um, on the substance of the bill itself, uh, I mean, these are points that others have, have no doubt made, uh, and I really just uh, will echo, I suspect, what others have said, and the Minister, I think, is well aware of the critiques that are coming from survivors' organisations, from the Irish Council of Civil Liberties, uh, from the Association of Mixed Race uh, Irish, and generally from survivors uh, of the mother and baby home uh, institutions. And the most... Um, uh, well, actually, there's quite a few problems with this. And although we're very glad to be sort of here at some level, uh, and in fact, the fact that we are here is because of the relentless, brave, heroic campaigning of survivors uh, who were let down so badly by the church and state, who were ignored for so long, uh, fighting on with determination and bravery and heroism, and finally forcing the state to acknowledge the wrong that has been done to so many people by the church and state and insist that they get acknowledgement, uh, apology and genuine redress. So in that context, it is very disappointing that the minister has not responded to the points that were made about the completely arbitrary and unjustified basis for the 180 day uh, cut off point for being in institutions. Um, I mean, I studied psychology <laughs> among other things when I was in uh, college. And one of the first things you do when you study psychology is you learn about children. You learn about child psychology. And to be honest, while there's many schools of thought in psychology uh, and psychoanalysis, there is absolutely no dispute about people who study the development of uh, human psychology is that literally the earliest hours and minutes and days of uh, a child's life shape that child. Uh, so to have the trauma of being separated uh, uh, by force, in effect, uh, by the perverted morality uh, that dominated the Irish state uh, and the thought children should be separated from mothers if those mothers didn't abide by certain uh, religious ideas uh, and a certain twisted notion of religious uh, morality, that that didn't instantly have effects on those children and those mothers from the very second it happens. From the very second it happens. Uh, it, it will shape the psychology uh, uh, of, uh, of children. And for many, and mothers, uh, and for many, the damage and the trauma that is done in those, uh, you know, in those first hours and days and weeks uh, will never, ever leave them. Uh, so the idea that you can have an arbitrary cutoff uh, where for 179 days, there's, what was the phrase that uh, Catherine Connolly referred to as such a ludicrous phrase, a tabula rasa? It's, you know, it's a nonsense a clean slate up until 180 days where you're not affected, but on day 181, now you're a legitimate case that deserves redress. It's, it's preposterous, utterly preposterous. Uh, and it sort of subverts uh, the integrity of the apology of the state. It subverts uh, and undoes the integrity of the acknowledgement the state has supposedly done 
to suggest such a thing, uh, that it can be, you know, valued in that way that oh, for 179 days, uh, if you were in an institution, really no harm's been done, but on day 180, harm was done. And after that, we're on a sort of escalate, an escalating scale. This, that's nonsense. It's just nonsense. Uh, and the, the, even at this stage, uh, the minister uh, should, um, uh, should change that and respond to what is self-evidently the case. Uh, the amount of time you may have spent in an institution uh, is not the key factor. Okay? It is the crime that was done to all in those situations uh, and then how that particularly impacts on people. Uh, and the trauma that they suffer uh, as a result uh, of that forced uh, separation, uh, incarceration and stigmatisation, all of the things uh, that go with it. Uh, and indeed, you know, I'm very well aware as somebody who's an adoptee myself, you know, there are good outcomes and there are bad outcomes, but everybody's affected. Uh, but some are affected in, in very, very different and more damaging ways. Uh, and that is not something that you can correlate in some sort of mechanical way according to the number of days you spent in an institution. And it, quite frankly, it is insulting to suggest that you can. Uh, it is also, uh, as has been said, a, 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 it's a, a matter of sadness that the minister has not acknowledged the pain, really, uh, and anger that survivors, uh, mothers and children who went through the mother and baby home regime uh, feel at uh, the report, at the mother and baby home report, which informs this, uh, and the failure to fully give weight to and acknowledge the testimonies of the survivors themselves. Uh, and uh, as the ICCL point out, the minister did promise a review, and that review has not happened. Um, I said on day one of that uh, report in the Dáil, I described it as a whitewash. And I still believe that to be the case, it was a whitewash. Because to downgrade the direct testimony of the survivors in the way that it did, and to have uh, insulting, uh, an insulting summary, uh, as was the case, which uses phrase like no evidence, uh, that uh, they were not incarcerated in the strict, quote, in the strict meaning of the word, uh, that certain evidence was, quote, the product of a creative writing class, etc., etc., is just outrageous, completely outrageous, insulting, uh, compounding uh, the, the pain and the trauma that people uh, felt. So uh, that review should have happened, and indeed uh, that review and that rejection of that sort of summarization uh, of the experience of all those who went through the mother and baby home scheme should have been the precondition, really, for establishing uh, the bill, the redress, uh, the redress uh, bill. Um, the uh, uh, other issues that um, have been pointed out again, I'm sure, to the minister already uh, is the. Uh, no specific compensation for legal uh, adoptions, for forced labour, uh, for unlawful vaccine trials, abuse as adopted, adopted child uh, or death, uh, or a specific provision for discrimination where uh, systematic racism was at work. And uh, as the Minister knows, uh, this issue was uh, highlighted by many, including the UN special, uh, the special ra rapporteurs. Uh, the fact that the bill uh, provides uh, payment in terms of, quote, work-related payment, uh, rather than uh, what it was, was forced labour, and acknowledging that it was forced labour, slavery in effect, uh, of the women that were incarcerated, women, uh, is, uh, un is unacceptable. Um, the fact that uh, the issue of absences from the institution are not uh, provided for uh, where there may have been, 
I'm sure so, almost certainly there were definitely good reasons, as the ICCL pointed out, in some cases for people escaping from these institutions, but the period for which they might have escaped uh, is not accounted for in terms of their residency uh, in, the, uh, in the institution. Uh, the, fact, the fact that in the general scheme of the bill, uh, it was referred to the fact that there would be an enhanced uh, medical uh, card, and that's been replaced by health services without charge, uh, but only for somebody who's resident for 180 uh, days. Again, the completely arbitrary uh, 180 uh, days, and for those survivors outside of Ireland, uh, the medical compensation, if you like, is only 3,000 uh, euro, which, you know, again, a completely arbitrary and totally inadequate uh, figure, and they do not get uh, the, uh, you know, the commitment to uh, all the health services they need and being provided uh, not without charge. Uh, the bill also doesn't provide specifically for trauma-informed counselling and therapies uh, as survivors have uh, has uh, called for, uh, and also the provisions of the bill which rule out the possibility of people availing of the scheme if they've already taken legal action uh, and got a court settlement in respect uh, of the period uh, in the institution that the bill, uh, the bill uh, covers. Um, the downgrading also of the requirements for the chief deciding officer in terms of advertising, uh, the fact of the redress uh, scheme and in particular uh, the fact that the bill does not uh, expressly require for advertisement abroad uh, as, as, as against uh, the, general, um, the, the, the general scheme of the bill which did provide uh, for, uh, for that. Uh, I'm sure the Minister has probably read a lot of these so I don't really need to, uh, I don't need to, uh, to rehearse them all but uh, certainly judging from the communications I'm receiving uh, there's a lot of people who feel there's a lot needs to change and be amended in this bill to address uh, those, uh, those concerns. Uh, but I'll yeah, just conclude by saying the worst thing of all is that arbitrary uh, 180 days. That's just, it is an insult and it needs to be changed, uh, Minister. And the full acknowledgement of how insulting uh, the mother and baby report was in its summary of, and essentially dismissal of the testimonies of the survivors uh, is, is, is a pretty deep uh, insult. Uh, and I think people now feel that the inadequacies in the bill show a sort of failure to fully, despite apologies and so on, to really take on board uh, the, trauma, the trauma and the suffering and uh, the hurt, if you like, that people uh, have experienced at the hand of this brutal regime that did so much wrong to so many women and children. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Dennis Nocton. Thank you, uh, Cahirli, and I welcome the opportunity to speak on this important piece of legislation. Uh, Minister, at the outset, uh, I want to reference correspondence that I received from uh, constituents in relation to the Irish Council for Liber Civil Liberties correspondence uh, regarding this legislation, and they have raised three uh, particular points. One, that the scheme should be uh, expanded to uh, all survivors, and this threshold of, of the six months uh, needs to be looked at. Secondly, that the uh, legal waiver uh, should be removed uh, that has been criticised uh, by the UN, uh, which has specifically asked for its removal. And thirdly, to increase the compensation uh, that's available. And I want to focus on that third aspect, uh, Minister. I want to focus my contribution on the provisions that are missing from this particular piece of legislation. And that is in relation to the vaccine trials and the failure by GlaxoSmithKline or GSK uh, the current corporate successor uh, to Welcome, which carried out uh, many of these vaccine trials in our mother and baby homes across uh, our country. I believe that GSK, which is the successor to those responsible for carrying out the vaccine trials on toddlers in our mother and baby, baby homes, must stand up and must be held accountable. 
where we do not, uh, at this stage, uh, we won't get answers. We must have an acknowledgement from GSK that what was done was completely unethical, and as a result, at the very least, they should and must contribute to this redress scheme. And Minister, as you know, there were at least 13 vaccine trials carried out uh, on more than 43,000 children, according to the Commission in, uh, of Investigation. And more than 1,000 of these children were in the institutions concerned. So, so, so survivors who were used literally as human guinea pigs in vaccine trials in the mother and baby, baby homes must receive an apology from GSK and must have this acknowledged by the company by making an offer of compensation for practices that would not have been tolerated in the United Kingdom where the company was based at that time. While the Mother and Baby Home uh, Commission of Investigation reviewed the medical records available to it, and I repeat, the records that were available to it, it concluded that there was no evidence of injury to the children involved in the vaccine trials. I believe, Minister, that this conclusion was simplistic. These children were treated little more than human pincushions by the companies and the clinicians involved due to the large number of injections that they received and blood samples that were taken. How can any of us be sure that there was no delayed immunological impacts from these formulations? Particularly if no guardian was able to tell a subsequent doctor treating the child that he or she had previously received an experimental vaccine formulation. The child as an adult would not be able to inform his or her treating doctor that he or she was involved in an experimental trial. Each of these children should be contacted, should have been contacted, should be contacted now, provided with their medical records. And these records, combined with their subsequent medical history, should be independently reviewed and a full and transparent report published on the conclusion of these assessments. Only then can we honestly claim that there is no evidence of injury to the children involved in these vaccine trials. And at a very minimum, this must now happen, and this must be provided for in the legislation, and the full cost must be borne by GSK. Minister, the Mother and Baby Homes Commission of Investigation report did, however, flag the issue of consent and the failure to secure it. Now, why is the issue of consent so important? It's primarily because uh, we all, each and every one of us, have a basic human right to our own bodily integrity. There is a need for informed consent in advance of any medical procedure or medical trial. And while those particular processes and procedures were far looser uh, in terms of the definition of medical consent in the era of these trials. The basic fact is that consent was not sought despite it being the legal and regulatory requirement at that time. Without engaging with the parents or guardians of the children, a clinician could not deem them to be suitable for inclusion in any trial. For example, Paragraph 34.121 of the Commission report on the 1968 to 1969 measles vaccine trial states that the trial should have excluded children, with, and I quote, with a personal history of convulsions or allergy, asthma or eczema, or a strong family history of same. Now, Minister, without consent, how could any of the clinicians have ascertained this in respect of those children in the mother and baby homes? And even at that time, consent was a standard procedure for vaccinations outside of clinical trials, at least in some 
of the mother and baby homes. For example, paragraph 34.71 states, the Dunboyne Institute records contain completed written consent forms relating to instances where infants resident there were presented for immunisation at the public health clinic. These consent forms were signed by either the mother or the matron. However, there were no consent forms available for the clinical trials. And it's also clear from the Commission's report that the Department of Health itself had serious problems with the use of children in these homes for clinical trials, like concerns uh, that were raised in the UK. However, paragraph 34.92 states, a Department of Health document dated the 13th of December 1963 dealing with the, this application noted that in April of 1962, Professor Meenan had asked for a field trial on an oral polio vaccine in Pellettstown. In that instance, it was noted that the Department of Health had no objection to the trial itself, but raised concerns regarding the selection of Pellettstown. And they quoted, while the procedure proposed appeared to be a safe one, the selection of a group to participate was open to objection and, and approval was not given on that occasion. The department did not want clinical trials carried out on children in homes. However, that didn't seem to make any difference to the clinicians involved, whether the department gave consent or not. Indeed, paragraph 34.163 notes that permission was sought for a field trial, uh, an oral, oral polio vaccine on the children in Pellettstown and was refused. The report goes on, on to state the Commission takes the view that there was a high probability that Pellettstown was in fact used in the trial despite the refusal of the Department of Health. And GSK have many questions to answer. Why did the scientific publications on the UK and the Nigerian trials specifically re refer to consent? Yet these references were conveniently left out of the same publications on the trials based on Irish children. Why was Ireland seen as a soft option for trials involving children in institutions? Clearly, such trials could not take place in the UK. Um, and that was also the case in Ireland, based on the regulatory and legal system that was in place at that time. However, because of the lack of enforcement in Ireland, GSK was happy to proceed, despite clearly knowing that there was no consent, as reflected in peer-reviewed academic journals, which had to have secured the authorization from GSK's predecessors before publication. It's also important to highlight at, the, at this point that these scientific publications were peer-reviewed in advance of publication in the British Medical Journal and in the Lancet. The academic publications of the British trials included an outline of the consent and confirmation that consent was obtained in line with law and ethical standards. However, this was not the case, as I say, in relation to the publication of the Irish trials. Why was this not set as a precondition of publication? Because it should have been. And if it had been, and the academics were told that they must provide that, maybe then these children would not have been exploited and those institutions would not have been used again and again and again and again for trials. This culture of cover-up went from the academic journals right up to the highest echelons in this state. The attitude was one to brush the problem under the carpet and it would go away. Paragraph 34.153 in the Commission uh, report states that the Department of Health had flagged uh, it in 1968 that Professor Meenan had conducted vaccine trials without the authorization 
of the minister, and yet nothing was done. And when it comes to mother and baby homes, it wasn't just the state, but reputable drug companies, reputable ac academics, and even reputable academic journals, such as the British Medical Journal and The Lancet, that were all prepared to turn a blind eye to the basic human rights of these children, purely because they were in institutions, purely because they were in institutions in Ireland, and purely because those institutions were not being properly regulated and monitored by the state. There was a blatant policy of just ignoring consent where it couldn't be obtained. Paragraph 34.122 of the Commission report states, on the 5th of September 1968, Dr Coffey told Dr Burland from Galaxo Laboratories that she had come up against the usual complications while trying to arrange a field trial of Galaxo's uh, measles vaccine in Dublin. The response from Galaxo was extremely interesting, according to the Commission report. Dr. Burland advised Dr. Coffey to liaise with Dr. Hillary, as she may be able to suggest a way in which you could overcome the problems that you have encountered. In other words, you uh, could get a way around uh, the law of the land and the refusal of the Department of Health to actually sanction this particular trial. There was a clear culture within the company uh, which has today morphed into GSK to circumvent the consent process. And let us not forget that there was a clear benefit, not just to GSK, but also to the clinicians who participated in those trials. The Commission report itself references direct financial payments. And at the very least, funding was provided to research facilities, which would assist those researchers in securing scientific publications. These, of course, uh, went a long way uh, along with the scientific publications of the trials themselves, which were facilitated by ignoring the basic ethical consent for vaccine trials. And all of these uh, scientific publications, the ones directly involving the trials, the ones where funding was provided both indirectly and directly uh, by the predecessors of GSK, ensured that these particular academics had scientific publications to their name, which secured them promotions uh, and financial benefits as a result of that, uh, as well as increased status within the scientific community itself. And of course, this was also of benefit to the universities involved, namely University College Dublin and Trinity College uh, Dublin, uh, who benefited indirectly by using these children, vulnerable children, as guinea pigs without any consent. Minister, GSK needs to clarify why these experimental vaccine formulations were not placed on the market uh, on a commercial basis. Was it, and I'd like to know, was it because they were not effective at preventing the diseases that they were supposed to? And if that was the case, it would have impacted on the subsequent immunity of the children involved in these studies. Were the children outside of homes, either in Ireland or in the UK, subjected to the same battery of needles that the children in the homes were? There was multiple administrations of vaccine doses and multiple blood sampling procedures. And I doubt very, very much, Minister, that any child outside of those institutions, either here in Ireland or in the United Kingdom, was uh, forced into uh, being used as human pincushions on a regular basis to the benefit of the clinicians, to the benefit of their institutions, and to the benefit of GSK. 
That company benefited financially from this research. It was happy enough to ensure that those uh, trials were conducted without consent, that they benefited from it, and they now need to live up to their responsibilities to these children and to their families. Karamahagot. Minister to reply. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and I want to thank all the deputies for their, their contributions this afternoon. And um, in the time that's that's available to me, I, I will try and address some of the specific queries, and I know we'll discuss many of them in the context of, of, of committee and report stage. Um, but I, I would maybe like to take the opportunity to set this bill uh, in the context of the government's action plan, um, all that government is doing in, in, response, in response to the needs of, of, of former residents and the legacy of these institutions. Um, and she's not here now, unfortunately, but, but Dep Deputy Connolly um, spoke with huge knowledge, as she always does, about the, the history of both these institutions at the time uh, and the history of the state's response to these institutions. And she spoke with very justifiable and very real anger in terms of both the history and the response. But it, in, in terms of the issues that she highlighted there, I need to speak to how the state is seeking to respond to the issues that she has raised and that so many others have raised. And that response is being undertaken in the context of the action plan. So Deputy Connolly spoke about Tume. She spoke about the attempts to silence the work that Catherine Corliss has done. And I know from my visit to Tume and I know from my engagement with Tune relatives, the core ask there has always been excavate the site, bring, uh, allow us rebury our relatives, or allow us bury them with dignity. And that is what the state is seeking to achieve in terms of the Institutional Burials Bill, in terms of the work that's already been done to start to establish the agency in Tune, uh, and, and that work that will begin at that site on, uh, in, 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 in the new year. Deputy Connolly said that, that, that I had, or, or the government, had totally ignored the issue of illegal birth registration. I suppose I, I, I just put on record that when I came into office, I had a, a, a report on, a, on an audit of um, what had been, at that point, potential illegal birth registrations uh, before me. I published that audit. One of the conclusions of that audit was that further research wouldn't develop, wouldn't deliver um, a significant additional information. I wasn't happy with that as a conclusion, so that's why I asked the Special Rapporteur for Child Protection to undertake a further piece of work on the issue of illegal birth registration. And he did, and he gave me that report. And a very significant amount of his recommendations are contained in the Birth Information and Tracing Bill in terms of how we actually provide practical, real, practical supports for people who find that their, their births were, were, were illegally, um, I illegally registered. But also in the Birth Information and Tracing Bill, we put in a provision that will allow TUSLA do further specialised tracing where there are files, and we know there are files with these suspicious markers, and TUSLA now has a statutory permission to undertake further work to discover if there are further illegal birth registrations that have take, t t t t taken place. So I think it's really important that the birth information and tracing legislation responded to the immediate needs of the uh, 153 people who are identified as suffering, uh, of having been subject to illegal birth registrations in St. Patrick's Guild, but is also allowing a process to look at the issue of illegal birth information further. A number of deputies and, and, and Deputy Richard, uh, Deputy Boyd Barrett discussed the, the issue of access to information. And I just wanted to take us back to, to, to the first piece of legislation I did uh, in this area, the database legislation. And I remember at the time I was accused of sealing records. But I just want to talk about what we did. We preserved a database that the Commission of Investigation um, D developed. They believed they had, to, they had to redact that to a point that would be destroyed. I didn't want to see that destroyed, so I brought forward legislation to protect it. That database is going to be used both in this legislation, the payments legislation, to allow survivors, rather than having to prove 
rather than having to try and find some information that, to show that they were in an institution for a certain period of time, that database will prove that they were in those institutions for a certain period of time. So it removes any burden of proof on survivors. That, legislation, that database is also being used by TUSLA and the AAI now as part of the birth information and tracing bill. That legislation that we introduced recently, that 4,600 people have already sought their information on, and in terms of the, 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 the times to, 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 that, that it will take for that information, I'll come back to you on that point, Deputy, Deputy Boyd Barrett. We did provide for a 30-day initial period, and if a file is complex, they can go to, 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 to 90 days. Um, there is a huge number of come in initially. That's a good thing, 4,600. But look, well, I'll come back to you on that. But importantly, the, um, da the, the database that I preserved, that this House voted to preserve in that initial, uh, in, in that initial debate in, in October, November 2020, it has already been used by my department to give over 700 people immediate access to their files in the Commission of Investigation report. And during that debate, many people spoke about the frustration on behalf of people who'd given uh, testimony before the Commission, that they couldn't get their information. So 700 people have already received information because of the vote that this House took. Um, and again, that comes back to one of the central issues that have dominated this whole debate, whether it's mother and baby institutions, but also other institutions, also the wider issue of adoption, the lack of access to information. And that's why earlier this year, this House voted to finally enshrine a statutory right of access to information, to your birth cert, to your early life information, to your medical information, to any items that your parent left for you uh, in the Birth Information and Tracing Act. After 20 years of successive governments trying to legislate on this issue, we have finally achieved a statutory right to birth information, and that is on foot of the work, and that was a key element of the government's response in terms of the action plan. We also, though, have to understand and properly reflect the history of what happened in these institutions. And that was something I was very conscious of. It was something that was raised with me early in my tenure. And that's why, again, under the action plan, we're bringing forward the National Records and Memorial Centre. That's why the site at Shaw McDermott Street, which I know for years was under uh, controversy, was threatened with being turned into a, 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 a boutique hotel, that has already been transferred from Dublin City Council to the Office of Public Works so we can begin the process of developing a national record and memorial centre where researchers, where individual survivors, where their families will have access to records, where there will be an appropriate historical depiction of what happened in, 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 in the institutions, in all institutions, and what can, where, which can act as a site of conscience. Um, one thing that, again, when I saw it in the action point, it, it, it didn't mean so much to me, the work on terminology, the work on appropriate terminology. And it was only when we were debating the birth information and tracing bill where we had that discussion about whether a mother should be referred to a, a mother or a birth mother. And it was only then that I understood the difference that that made to so many women, how the term birth mother that I'd always used was taken as deeply insulting to a certain number of mothers. And on foot of that, we made those changes. And that's why that research, again, being t carried out under the action plan is so important. And this bill today, the, insti the, the, the institutional payment scheme, is again part of the state's response. And as I said before, redress, the concept of redress means different things to different survivors, and different survivors have different priorities. And for some it's payments, some it's access to, 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 to health supports, some it's the appropriate uh, reburial of, 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 of their family members, for some it's access to that information. And what the state and what the government is trying to do is advance all of these issues, and advance them rapidly, and you know, when, when, you, the, 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 when the, the action plan was, was, uh, was, was published, I think, 18 months ago, and when you look at what has been achieved, there has been significant progress, though absolutely recognising so much more, so much more to, uh, to, 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 be, to be undertaken. In terms of some of the specific points, and many deputies raised the issue of, of engagement with religious orders. And what I will say is, the Commission made ext 
extremely significant findings in terms of the culpability of the state, but also of the culpability of religious orders. And I have always believed, and I've always said publicly, that I believe that if the religious orders uh, apologies are to have any meaning, they have to be combined with some real tangible actions. And that's what I've said to the orders, and I've met seven of the orders, and I've met, the, um, and, and I've, I've met heads of the, 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 the Church of Ireland. And those negotiations are ongoing, and there's, you know, I, 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 don't have a date, I don't have a date for when they'll end, but they are ongoing and they are being pursued. But what I was always clear about is that the need for time, the need to provide for, for former residents with redress should not be delayed according to the outcome of those negotiations. So those negotiations will go on and we will provide redress under that particular scheme. Deputy Nocton spoke with, with great passion and, 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 and great power in terms of the issue of engagement with pharmaceutical, com of, of the culpability of, of pharmaceutical companies. And I absolutely agree with everything he said. And I said that to GSK, I met with GSK, I put to them the findings of the report in terms of, in, 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 in terms of, of vaccine trials, and I asked them to consider their, their, their response. And I'm not, I, 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 I think their response falls far short. I know they've provided information to people who believe they were subject to, 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 um, to trials, but I do not believe that that's an adequate response in terms of the significance, and particularly, and Deputy Nocton, I know he's campaigned on this for long before I was in this house, in, particularly in terms of the context of the lack of informed consent. Chair, I see you're, you're indicating, and, and look, 10 minutes is, is not enough to deal with the, the many significant important issues that deputies have raised. If I can just, if you will indulge me for 30 seconds, because Deputy Function raised a really important point in terms of certain solicitor firms writing to survivors, asking them to sign up with them, uh, to pay them for legal advice. Uh, we're aware of that. There is no need for any survivor seeking to use this scheme. There is no need for legal advice because it's not being done in an adversarial manner. In two stages, we at the state can provide them with, with legal advice. So in terms of our communications with survivors, and particularly the bulletin we send out to, to the email list, we'll make that point clear that, that people should not feel pressured to, to, to sign up to a solicitor firm. Thank and you, look, Mr. I look forward to dealing with many of the other issues in terms of committee stage. Thank, Thank you, Minister. Chair. Thank you. And the motion is that this bill be now read a second time. Um, Natakti Atarvish Arvish Ta. Natakti Ata and Aguinya Arvish Neil. The motion is carried. I move that the bill be referred to the Select Committee on Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth. Um, next item is statements on energy security.